Act One of The Doctor's Dilemma. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Doctor's Dilemma by George Bernard Shaw. Dramatis Personae. Red Penny. Read by Derek Powell. Emmy. Read by A. Mallon. Colenso Ridgen. Read by Bruce Peary. Schutzmacher, read by John Steigerwald. Sir Patrick Cullen, read by Algie Pug. Cutler Walpole, read by Elizabeth Clett. Bibi, Sir Ralph Bloomfield Bonington, read by Phil Chenever. Doctor Blankensop, read by M. B. Mrs. Jennifer Dubedat, read by Ariel Lipshaw. The part of Lewis played by Anthony. The maid, read by. Rashada. The Newspaper Man, read by David Lawrence. The Secretary, read by Peter Bishop. Narrated by Elizabeth Clatt. Act One. On the 15th of June, 1903, in the early forenoon, a medical student, surname Redpenny, Christian name unknown and of no importance, sits at work in a doctor's consulting room. He devils for the doctor by answering his letters, acting as his domestic laboratory assistant, and making himself indispensable generally, in return for unspecified advantages involved by intimate intercourse with a leader of his profession, and amounting to an informal apprenticeship and a temporary affiliation. Red Penny is not proud, and will do anything he is asked without reservation of his personal dignity if he is asked in a fellow-creaturely way. He is a wide, open-eyed, ready, credulous, friendly, hasty youth, with his hair and clothes in reluctant transition from the untidy boy to the tidy doctor. Redpenny is interrupted by the entrance of an old serving-woman who has never known the cares, the preoccupations, the responsibilities, jealousies, and anxieties of personal beauty. She has the complexion of never-washed gypsy, incurable by any detergent, and she has, not a regular beard and moustaches, which could at least be trimmed and waxed into a masculine presentableness, but a whole crop of small beards and moustaches, mostly springing from moles all over her face. She carries a duster and toddles about meddlesomely, spying out dust so diligently that whilst she is flicking off one speck she is already looking elsewhere for another. In conversation she has the same trick hardly ever looking at the person she is addressing, except when she is excited. She has only one manner, and that is the manner of an old family nurse to a child just after it has learnt to walk. She has used her ugliness to secure indulgences unattainable by Cleopatra or fair Rosamond, and has the further great advantage over them that age increases her qualification instead of impairing it. Being an industrious, agreeable, and popular old soul, she is a walking sermon on the vanity of feminine prettiness. Just as Red Penny has no discovered Christian name, she has no discovered surname, and is known throughout the doctor's quarter between Cavendish Square and the Marlebone Road simply as Emmy. The consulting room has two windows looking on Queen Anne Street. Between the two is a marble-topped console, with haunched gilt legs ending in sphinx claws. The huge pier-glass which surmounts it is mostly disabled from reflection by elaborate painting on its surface of palms, ferns, lilies, tulips, and sunflowers. The adjoining wall contains the fireplace, with two armchairs before it. As we happen to face the corner, we see nothing of the other two walls. On the right of the fireplace, or rather on the right of any person facing the fireplace, is the door. On its left is the writing-table at which Red Penny sits. It is an untidy table with a microscope, several test-tubes, and a spirit-lamp standing up through its litter of papers. There is a couch in the middle of the room, at right angles to the console, and parallel to the fireplace. A chair stands between the couch and the windowed wall. The windows have green Venetian blinds and rep curtains, and there is a gasolier, but it is a convert to electric lighting. The wallpaper and carpets are mostly green, coeval with the gasolier and the Venetian blinds. The house, in fact, was so well furnished in the middle of the nineteenth century that it stands unaltered to this day, and is still quite presentable. Emmy, entering and immediately beginning to dust the couch. 
There's a lady bothering me to see the doctor. Well, she can't see the doctor. Look here, what's the use of telling you that the doctor can't take any new patients when the moment a knock comes to the door, in you bounce to ask whether he can see somebody? Who asked you whether he could see somebody? You did. I said, there's a lady bothering me to see the doctor. That isn't asking, it's telling. Well, is the lady bothering you any reason for you to come bothering me when I'm busy? Have you seen the papers? No. Not seen the birthday honors? What the? Now, now, ducky. What do you suppose I care about the birthday honors? Get out of this with your chattering. Dr. Ridgen will be down before I have these letters ready. Get out! Dr. Ridgen won't never be down any more, young man. She detects dust on the console and is down on it immediately. Redpenny, jumping up and following her. What? He's been made a knight. Mind you, don't go Dr. Ridgening him in them letters. Sir Colenso Ridgen is to be his name now. I'm jolly glad. I never was so taken aback. I always thought his great discoveries was fudge, let alone the mess of them, with his drops of blood and tubes full of Maltese fever and the like. Now he'll have a rare laugh at me. Serve you right. It was like your cheek to talk to him about science. He returns to his table and resumes his writing. Ugh, I don't think much of science. And neither will you when you've lived as long with it as I have. What's on my mind is answering the door. Old Sir Patrick Cullen has been here already, and left first congratulations. Hadn't time to come up on his way to the hospital, but was determined to be first. Coming back, he said. All the rest will be here, too. The knocker will be going all day. What I'm afraid of is that the doctor will want a footman like all the rest, now that he's Sir Colenso. Mind, don't you go putting him up to it, Ducky, for he'll never have any comfort with anybody but me to answer the door. I know who to let in and who to keep out. And that reminds me of the poor lady. I think he ought to see her. She's just the kind that puts him in a good temper. She dusts Red Penny's papers. I tell you, he can't see anybody. Do go away, Emmy. How can I work with you dusting all over me like this? Writing letters working. Oh, there goes the bell. She looks out of the window. A doctor's carriage. That's more congratulations. She is going out when Sir Colenso Ridgen enters. Have you finished your two eggs, Sonny? Yes. Have you put on your clean vest? Yes. That's my ducky diamond. Now keep yourself tidy and don't go messing about and dirtying your hands. The people are coming to congratulate you. She goes out. Sir Colenso Ridgen is a man of fifty who has never shaken off his youth. He has the off-handed manner and the little audacities of address which a sly and sensitive man acquires in breaking himself in to intercourse with all sorts and conditions of men. His face is a good deal lined, his movements are slower than, for instance, red pennies, and his flaxen hair has lost its luster but in figure and manner he is more the young man than the titled physician. Even the lines in his face are those of overwork and restless skepticism, perhaps partly of curiosity and appetite, rather than of age. Just at present the announcement of his knighthood in the morning papers makes him specially self-conscious, and consequently specially off-hand with Redpenny. Have you seen the papers? You'll have to alter the name in the letters if you haven't. Emmy has just told me. I'm awfully glad. Enough, young man, enough. You will soon get accustomed to it. They ought to have done it years ago. They would have, only they couldn't stand Emmy opening the door, I dare say. Emmy, at the door, announces Dr. Shoemaker. She withdraws. A middle-aged gentleman, well-dressed, comes in with a friendly but propitiatory air, not quite sure of his reception. His combination of soft manners and responsive kindliness with a certain unseizable reserve and a familiar yet foreign chiselling of feature, reveal the Jew. In this instance the handsome gentlemanly Jew, gone a little pigeon-breasted and stale after thirty, as handsome young Jews often do, 
but still decidedly good-looking. Do you remember me? Schutzmacher, University College School in Belsize Avenue. Looney Schutzmacher, you know. What? Looney? He shakes hands cordially. Why, man, I thought you were dead long ago. Sit down. Schutzmacher sits on the couch, Ridgen on the chair between it and the window. Where have you been these thirty years? In general practice until a few months ago. I've retired. Well done, Looney. I wish I could afford to retire. Was your practice in London? No. Fashionable coast practice, I suppose? How could I afford to buy a fashionable practice? I hadn't a wrap. I set up in a manufacturing town in the Midlands, in a little surgery at ten shillings a week. And made your fortune? Well, I'm pretty comfortable. I have a place in Hertfordshire, besides our flat in town. If you ever want a quiet Saturday to Monday, I'll take you down in my motor at an hour's notice. Just rolling in money. I wish you rich GPs would teach me how to make some. What's the secret of it? Oh, in my case the secret was simple enough, though I suppose I should have got into trouble if it had attracted any notice. And I'm afraid you'll think it rather infradig. Oh, I have an open mind. What was the secret? Well, the secret was just two words. Not consultation-free, was it? No, no, really. No, of course not. I was only joking. My two words were simply cure guaranteed. Cure guaranteed? Guaranteed. After all, that's what everybody wants from a doctor, isn't it? My dear Looney, it was an inspiration. Was it on the brass plate? There was no brass plate. It was a shop window. Red, you know, with black lettering. Dr. Leo Schutzmacher, L-R-C-P-M-R-C-S. Advice and medicine sixpence. Cure guaranteed. And the guarantee proved sound nine times out of ten, eh? Oh, much oftener than that. You see, most people get well all right if they are careful and you give them a little sensible advice. And the medicine really did them good. Perishes chemical food. Phosphates, you know. One tablespoon to a twelve-ounce bottle of water. Nothing better, no matter what the case is. Red Penny, make a note of Parrish's chemical food. I take it myself, you know, when I feel run down. Goodbye. You don't mind my calling, do you? Just to congratulate you. Delighted, my dear Looney. Come to lunch on Saturday next week. Bring your motor and take me down to Hartford. I will. We shall be delighted. Thank you. Goodbye. He goes out with Ridgen, who returns immediately. Old Paddy Cullen was here before you were up to be the first to congratulate you. Indeed. Who taught you to speak of Sir Patrick Cullen as Old Paddy Cullen, you young ruffian? You never call him anything else. Not now that I am Sir Colenso. Next thing you fellows will be calling me Old Collie Ridgen. We do, at St. Anne's. Yeah, that's what makes the medical student the most disgusting figure in modern civilization. No veneration, no manners, no... Emmy, at the door, announcing... Sir Patrick Cullen. She retires. Sir Patrick Cullen is more than twenty years older than Ridgen, not yet quite at the end of his tether, but near it, and resigned to it. His name, his plain, downright, sometimes rather arid common sense, his large build and stature, the absence of those odd moments of ceremonial servility by which an old English doctor sometimes shows you what the status of the profession was in England in his youth, and an occasional turn of speech, are Irish. But he has lived all his life in England, and is thoroughly acclimatized. His manner to Ridgen, whom he likes, is whimsical and fatherly. To others he is a little gruff and uninviting, apt to substitute more or less expressive grunts for articulate speech, and generally indisposed, at his age, to make much social effort. He shakes Ridgen's hand and beams at him cordially and jocularly. Well, young chap, is your hat too small for you, eh? Much too small. I owe it all to you. Blarney, me boy. Thank you all the same. He sits in one of the armchairs near the fireplace. Ridgen sits on the couch. I've come to talk to you a bit. To Redpenny. Young man, get out. Certainly, Sir Patrick. He collects his papers and makes for the door. 
Thank you. That's a good lad. Redpenny vanishes. They all put up with me, these young chaps, because I'm an old man, a real old man, not like you. You're only beginning to give yourself the airs of age. Did you ever see a boy cultivating a moustache? Well, a middle-aged doctor cultivating a grey head is much the same sort of spectacle. Good Lord, yes, I suppose so. And I thought that the days of my vanity were past. Tell me, at what age does a man leave off being a fool? Remember the Frenchman who asked his grandmother at what age we get free from the temptations of love? The old woman said she didn't know. <laughs> well, I make you the same answer. But the world's growing very interesting to me now, Collie. You keep up your interest in science, do you? Lord, yes. Modern science is a wonderful thing. Look at your great discovery. Look at all the great discoveries. Where are they leading to? Way back to my poor dear old father's ideas and discoveries. He's been dead now over forty years. Oh, it's very interesting. Well, there's nothing like progress, is there? Don't misunderstand me, my boy. I'm not belittling your discovery. Most discoveries are made regularly every fifteen years, and it's fully a hundred and fifty since yours was made last. That's something to be proud of. But your discovery is not new. It's only inoculation. My father practiced inoculation until he was made criminal in 1840. That broke the poor old man's heart, Cully. He died of it. And now it turns out that my father was right after all. You brought us back to inoculation. I know nothing about smallpox. My line is tuberculosis and typhoid and plague. But of course the principle of all vaccines is the same. Tuberculosis? Hmm, hmm. You found out how to cure consumption, eh? I believe so. Ah, yes. It's very interesting. What is it the old cardinal says in Browning's play? I have known four and twenty leaders of revolt. Well, I have known over thirty men that found out how to cure consumption. Why do people go on dying of it, Cully? Devilment, I suppose. There was my father's old friend, George Boddington, of Sutton Coldfield. He discovered the open-air cure in 1840. He was ruined and driven out of his practice for only opening the windows, and now we won't let a consumptive patient have as much as a roof over his head. Oh, it's very, very interesting to an old man. You old cynic, you don't believe a bit in my discovery. No, no. I don't go quite as far as that, Cully. But still, you remember Jane Marsh? Jane Marsh? No. You don't? No. You mean to tell me you don't remember the woman with the tuberculosis ulcer on her arm? Oh, your washerwoman's daughter. Was her name Jane Marsh? I forgot. Perhaps you've forgotten also that you undertook to cure her with Cork's tuberculin. And instead of curing her, it rotted her arm right off. Yes, I remember. Poor Jane. However, she makes a good living out of that arm now by showing it at medical lectures. Still... That wasn't quite what you intended, was it? I took my chance of it. Jane did, you mean. Well, it's always the patient who has to take the chance when an experiment is necessary, and we can find out nothing without experiment. What did you find out from Jane's case? I found out that the inoculation that ought to cure sometimes kills. I could have told you that. I've tried these modern inoculations a bit myself. I've killed people with them. And I've cured people with them, but I gave them up because I could never tell which I was going to do. Ridgeon, taking a pamphlet from a drawer in the writing table and handing it to him. Read that the next time you have an hour to spare, and you'll find out why. Sir Patrick, grumbling and fumbling for his spectacles. Oh, bother your pamphlets. What's the practice of it? Looking at the pamphlet. Obsinin? What the devil is obsinin? Opsonin is what you butter the disease germs with to make your white blood corpuscles eat them. That's not new. I've heard this notion that the white corpuscles... What is it that what's his name? Mechnikov. Cause them. Phagocytes. Aye, phagocytes. Yes, yes, yes. 
Well, I've heard this theory that the phagocytes eat up the disease germs years ago, long before you came into fashion. Besides, they don't always eat them. They do when you butter them with obstinin. Gammon. No, it's not gammon. What it comes to in practice is this. The phagocytes won't eat the microbes unless the microbes are nicely buttered for them. Well, the patient manufactures the butter for himself, all right, but my discovery is that the manufacture of that butter, which I call opsonin, goes on in the system by ups and downs, nature being always rhythmical, you know, and that what the inoculation does is to stimulate the ups or downs, as the case may be. If we had inoculated Jane Marsh when her butter factory was on the up grade, we should have cured her arm. But we got in on the downgrade and lost her arm for her. I call the upgrade the positive phase and the downgrade the negative phase. Everything depends on your inoculating at the right moment. Inoculate when the patient is in the negative phase, and you kill. Inoculate when the patient is in the positive phase, and you cure. And pray, how are you to know whether the patient is in the positive or the negative phase? Send a drop of the patient's blood to the laboratory at St. Anne's, and in fifteen minutes I'll give you his opsonin index and figures. If the figure is one, inoculate and cure. If it's under point eight, inoculate and kill. That's my discovery, the most important that has been made since Harvey discovered the circulation of the blood. My tuberculosis patients don't die now. And mine do, when my inoculation catches them in the negative phase, as you call it. Eh? Precisely. To inject a vaccine into a patient without first testing his opsonin is as near murder as a respectable practitioner can get. If I wanted to kill a man, I should kill him that way. Emmy, looking in. Will you see a lady that wants her husband's lungs cured? No, haven't I told you I will see nobody? To Sir Patrick. I live in a state of siege ever since it got about that I'm a magician who can cure consumption with a drop of serum. To Emmy. Don't come to me again about people who have no appointments. I tell you, I can see nobody. Well, I'll tell her to wait a bit. You'll tell her I can't see her and send her away, do you hear? Well, will you see Mr. Cutler Walpole? He don't want a cure. He only wants to congratulate you. Of course. Show him up. She turns to go. Stop. To Sir Patrick. I want two minutes more with you between ourselves. Emmy, ask Mr. Walpole to wait just two minutes while I finish a consultation. Oh, he'll wait all right. He's talking to the poor lady. She goes out. Well, what is it? Don't laugh at me. I want your advice. Professional advice? Yes, there's something the matter with me. I don't know what it is. Neither do I. I suppose you've been sounded. Yes, of course. There's nothing wrong with any of the organs, nothing special anyhow. But I have a curious aching. I don't know where. I can't localize it. Sometimes I think it's my heart. Sometimes I suspect my spine. It doesn't exactly hurt me, but it unsettles me completely. I feel that something is going to happen. And there are other symptoms. Scraps of tunes come into my head that seem to me very pretty, though they're quite commonplace. Do you hear voices? No. I'm glad of that. When my patients tell me they've made a greater discovery than Harvey, and that they hear voices, I look him up. You think I'm mad. That's just the suspicion that has come across me once or twice. Tell me the truth. I can bear it. You sure there are no voices? Quite sure. Then it's only foolishness. Have you ever met anything like it before in your practice? Oh, yes, often. It's very common between the ages of seventeen and twenty-two. It sometimes comes on again at forty or thereabouts. You're a bachelor, you see. It's not serious, if you're careful. About my food? No, about your behavior. There's nothing wrong with your spine, and there's nothing wrong with your heart. But there's something wrong with your common sense. You're not going to die, but you may be going to make a fool of yourself. So, be careful. I see you don't believe in my discovery. Well, sometimes I don't believe in it myself. Thank you, all the same. Shall we have Walpole up? Oh, have him up. Ridgeon rings. 
He's a clever operator, is Walpole, though he's only one of your chloroform surgeons. In my early days, you made your man drunk, and the porters and students held him down. Then you had to set your teeth and finish the job fast. Nowadays you work at your ease, and the pain doesn't come until afterwards, when you've taken your check and rolled up your bag and left the house. I tell you, Cully, chloroform has done a lot of mischief. It's enabled every fool to be a surgeon. Ridgeon to Emmy, who answers the bell. Show Mr. Walpole up. He's talking to the lady. Did I not tell you? Emmy goes out without heeding him. He gives it up with a shrug, and plants himself with his back to the console, leaning resignedly against it. I know you cutler whirlpools and they like. They've found out that a man's body's full of bits and scraps of old organs he has no mortal use for. Thanks to chloroform, you can cut half a dozen of them out without leaving him any the worse, except for the illness and the guineas it costs him. I knew the whirlpools well fifteen years ago. The father used to snip off the ends of people's uvulas for fifty guineas, and paint their throats with caustic every day for a year at two guineas a time. His brother-in-law extirpated tonsils at two hundred guineas until he took up women's cases at double the fees. Goodly himself worked hard at anatomy to find something fresh to operate on, and at last he caught hold of something he calls the nuciform sack, which he's made quite the fashion. People pay him five hundred guineas to cut it out. They might as well get their hair cut for all the difference it makes, but I suppose they feel important after it. You can't go out to dinner now without your neighbour bragging to you of some useless operation or other. Mr. Cutler Walpole. She goes out. Cutler Walpole is an energetic, unhesitating man of forty, with a cleanly modelled face, very decisive and symmetrical about the shortish, salient, rather pretty nose, and the three trimly turned corners made by his chin and jaws. In comparison with Ridgeon's delicate broken lines, and Sir Patrick's softly rugged aged ones, his face looks machine-made and beeswaxed, but his scrutinizing, daring eyes give it life and force. He seems never at a loss, never in doubt. One feels that if he made a mistake he would make it thoroughly and firmly. He has neat, well-nourished hands, short arms, and is built for strength and compactness rather than for height. He is smartly dressed with a fancy waistcoat, a richly colored scarf secured by a handsome ring, ornaments on his watch-chain, spats on his shoes, and a general air of the well-to-do sportsman about him. He goes straight across to Ridgeon, and shakes hands with him. "'My dear Ridgeon, best wishes, heartiest congratulations. You deserve it.' "'Thank you.' "'As a man, mind you. You deserve it as a man. The opsonin is simple rot, as any capable surgeon can tell you. But we're all delighted to see your personal qualities officially recognized. Sir Patrick, how are you? I sent you a paper lately about a little thing I invented, a new saw for shoulder blades. Yes, I got it. It's a good saw, a useful, handy instrument. I knew you'd see its points. Yes, I remember that saw sixty-five years ago. What? It was called a cabinet-maker's jimmy then. Get out! Nonsense! Cabinet maker be— Never mind him, Walpole. He's jealous. By the way, I hope I'm not disturbing you two in anything private. No, no, sit down. I was only consulting him. I'm rather out of sorts. Overwork, I suppose. I know what's the matter with you. I can see it in your complexion. I can feel it in the grip of your hand. What is it? Blood poisoning. Blood poisoning? Impossible. I tell you, blood poisoning. Ninety-five per cent of the human race suffer from chronic blood poisoning, and die of it. It's as simple as A, B, C. Your nuciform sac is full of decaying matter, undigested food and waste products, rank tomates. Now you take my advice, Ridgeon. Let me cut it out for you. You'll be another man afterwards. Don't you like him as he is? No, I don't. I don't like any man who hasn't a healthy circulation. I tell you this, 
In an intelligently governed country, people wouldn't be allowed to go about with nuciform sacs making themselves centers of infection. The operation ought to be compulsory. It's ten times more important than vaccination. Have you had your own sack removed, may I ask? I haven't got one. Look at me. I've no symptoms. I'm as sound as a bell. About five percent of the population haven't got any, and I'm one of the five percent. I'll give you an instance. You know Mrs. Jack Foljam, the smart Mrs. Foljam? I operated at Easter on her sister-in-law, Lady Gorin, and found she had the biggest sack I ever saw. It held about two ounces. Well, Mrs. Foljam had the right spirit, the genuine hygienic instinct. She couldn't stand her sister-in-law being a clean, sound woman, and she's simply a whited sepulchre. So she insisted on my operating on her, too. And by George, sir, she hadn't any sack at all. Not a trace, not a rudiment. I was so taken aback, so interested, that I forgot to take the sponges out and was stitching them up inside her when the nurse missed them. Somehow I'd made sure she'd have an exceptionally large one. He sits down on the couch, squaring his shoulders and shooting his hands out of his cuffs as he sets his knuckles akimbo. Emmy, looking in. Sir Ralph Bloomfield Bonington. A long and expectant pause follows this announcement. All look to the door, but there is no Sir Ralph. Where is he? Ah, uh, drat him! I thought he was following me. He stayed down to talk to that lady. I told you to tell that lady. Emmy vanishes. Walpole, jumping up again. Oh, by the way, Ridgeon, that reminds me. I've been talking to that poor girl. It's her husband, and she thinks it's a case of consumption. The usual wrong diagnosis. These damned general practitioners ought never to be allowed to touch a patient except under the orders of a consultant. She's been describing his symptoms to me, and the case is as plain as a pikestaff. Bad blood poisoning. Now she's poor. She can't afford to have him operated on. Well, you send him to me. I'll do it for nothing. There's room for him in my nursing home. I'll put him straight and feed him up and make him happy. I like making people happy. He goes to the chair near the window. Here he is. Sir Rafe Bloomfield Bonington wafts himself into the room. He is a tall man, with a head like a tall and slender egg. He has been in his time a slender man, but now, in his sixth decade, his waistcoat has filled out somewhat. His fair eyebrows arch good-naturedly and uncritically. He has a most musical voice. His speech is a perpetual anthem, and he never tires of the sound of it. He radiates an enormous self-satisfaction. Cheering, reassuring, healing by the mere incompatibility of disease or anxiety with his welcome presence. Even broken bones, it is said, have been known to unite at the sound of his voice. He is a born healer, as independent of mere treatment and skill as any Christian scientist. When he expands into oratory or scientific exposition, he is as energetic as Walpole. But it is with a bland, voluminous, atmospheric energy which envelops its subject and its audience, and makes interruption or inattention impossible and imposes veneration and credulity on all but the strongest minds. He is known in the medical world as Beebe, and the envy roused by his success in practice is softened by the conviction that he is, scientifically considered, a colossal humbug. The fact being that, though he knows just as much, and just as little, as his contemporaries, the qualifications that pass muster in common men reveal their weakness when hung on his egregious personality. Aha! Sir Colenso, Sir Colenso, eh? Welcome to the Order of Knighthood. Shaking hands. Thank you, B.B. What, Sir Patrick, and how are we today? A little chilly, a little stiff, but hale and still the cleverest of us all. What, Walpole, the absent-minded beggar, eh? What does that mean? Have you forgotten the lovely opera singer I sent you to have that growth taken off her vocal cords? Great heavens, man, you don't mean to say you sent her for a throat operation. Ha, 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 ha. Ah, you removed her nuciform sack. Well, well, force of habit, force of habit. Never mind, never mind. 
She got back her voice after it, and thinks you the greatest surgeon alive. And so you are, so you are, so you are. Blood poisoning. I see, I see. And how is a certain distinguished family get none under your care, Sir Ralph? Our friend Ridgeon will be gratified to hear that I have tried his obsonin treatment on little Prince Henry with complete success. But how? I suspected typhoid. The head gardener's boy had it, so I just called at St. Anne's one day and got a tube of your very excellent serum. You are out, unfortunately. I hope they explained to you carefully. Lord bless you, my dear fellow. I didn't need any explanations. I left my wife in the carriage at the door, and I'd no time to be taught my business by your young chaps. I know all about it. I've handled these antitoxins ever since they first came out. But they're not antitoxins, and they're dangerous unless you use them at the right time. Of course they are. Everything is dangerous unless you take it at the right time. An apple at breakfast does you good. An apple at bedtime upsets you for a week. There are only two rules for antitoxins. First, don't be afraid of them. Second, inject them a quarter of an hour before meals three times a day. Great heavens, Bibi! No, no, no! Yes, 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 Kali. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, you know. It was an immense success. It acted like magic on the little prince. Up went his temperature, off to bed I packed him, and in a week he was all right again and absolutely immune from typhoid for the rest of his life. The family were very nice about it. Their gratitude was quite touching, but I said they owed it all to you, Ridgeon and I'm glad to think that your knighthood is the result. I am deeply obliged to you. Overcome, he sits down on the chair near the couch. Not at all, not at all. Your own merit. Come, 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 don't give way. It's nothing. I was a little giddy just now. Overwork, I suppose. Blood poisoning. Overwork? There is no such thing. I do the work of ten men. Am I giddy? No, no. If you're not well, you have a disease. It may be a slight one, but it's a disease. And what is a disease? The lodgment in the system of a pathogenic germ and the multiplication of that germ. What is the remedy? A very simple one. Find the germ and kill it. Suppose there's no germ. Impossible, Sir Patrick. There must be a germ. Else how could the patient be ill? Can you show me the germ of overwork? No, but why? Why? Because, my dear Sir Patrick, though the germ is there, it's invisible. Nature has given it no danger signal for us. These germs, these bacilli, are translucent bodies, like glass, like water. To make them visible, you must stain them. Well, my dear Patty, do what you will. Some of them won't stain. They won't take cochineal. They won't take methylene blue. They won't take gentian violet. They won't take any coloring matter. Consequently, though we know, as scientific men, that they exist, we cannot see them. But can you disprove their existence? Can you conceive the disease existing without them? Can you, for instance, show me a case of diphtheria without the bacillus? No, but I'll show you the same bacillus without the disease in your own throat. No, not the same, Sir Patrick. It is an entirely different bacillus. Only the two are, unfortunately, so exactly alike that you cannot see the difference. You must understand, my dear Sir Patrick, that every one of these interesting little creatures has an imitator. Just as men imitate each other, germs imitate each other. There is the genuine diphtheria bacillus discovered by Lofer, and there is the pseudo-bacillus, exactly like it, which you could find, as you say, in my own throat. And how do you tell one from the other? Well, obviously, if the bacillus is the genuine loafer, you have diphtheria. And if it's the pseudo-bacillus, you're quite well. Nothing simpler. Science is always simple and always profound. It is only the half-truths that are dangerous. Ignorant faddists pick up some superficial information about germs, and they write to the papers and try to discredit science. They dupe and mislead many honest and worthy people. 
but science has a perfect answer to them on every point. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep, or taste not the Pyarian spring. I mean no disrespect to your generation, Sir Patrick. Some of you old stagers did marvels through sheer professional intuition and clinical experience, but when I think of the average men of your day, ignorantly bleeding and cupping and purging and scattering germs over their patients from their clothes and instruments, and contrast all that with the scientific certainty and simplicity of my treatment of the little prince the other day, I can't help being proud of my own generation, the men who were trained on the germ theory, the veterans of the great struggle over evolution in the seventies. We may have our faults, but at least we are men of science. That is why I am taking up your treatment, Ridgeon, and pushing it. It's scientific. He sits down on the chair near the couch. A Dr. Blenkinsop. Dr. Blenkinsop is a very different case from the others. He is clearly not a prosperous man. He is flabby and shabby, cheaply fed and cheaply clothed. He has the lines made by a conscience between his eyes, and the lines made by continual money worries all over his face, cut all the deeper as he has seen better days, and hails his well-to-do colleagues as their contemporary and old hospital friend, though even in this he has to struggle with the diffidence of poverty and relegation to the poorer middle class. How are you, Blenkinsop? I've come to offer my humble congratulations. Oh, dear! All the great guns are before me. How do you do, Blenkinsop? How do you do? And Sir Patrick, too. Mm. You've met Walpole, of course. How do you do? It's the first time I've had that honor. In my poor little practice there are no chances of meeting you great men. I, I know nobody but the St. Anne's men of my own day. And so... Your Sir Colenso, how does it feel? Foolish at first. Don't take any notice of it. I'm ashamed to say I haven't a notion what your great discovery is. Uh, but I congratulate you all the same, for the sake of old times. But, my dear Blenkinsop, you used to be rather keen on science. I used to be a lot of things. I used to have two or three decent suits of clothes and flannels to go up the river on Sundays. Look at me now. This is my best, and it must last till Christmas. Oh, what can I do? I haven't opened a book since I was qualified thirty years ago. Oh, I used to read the medical papers at first, but you know how soon a man drops that. Besides, I can't afford them. And what are they, after all, but trade papers, full of advertisements? I've forgotten all my science. What's the use of pretending I haven't? But I have great experience, clinical experience. And bedside experience is the main thing, isn't it? No doubt. Always provided, mind you, that you have a sound scientific theory to correlate your observations at the bedside. Mere experience by itself is nothing. If I take my dog to the bedside with me, he sees what I see, but he learns nothing from it. Why? Because he's not a scientific dog. It amuses me to hear you physicians and general practitioners talking about clinical experience. What do you see at the bedside but the outside of the patient? Well, it isn't his outside that's wrong, except perhaps in skin cases. What you want is a daily familiarity with people's insides, and that you can only get at the operating table. I know what I'm talking about. I've been a surgeon and consultant for twenty years and I've never known a general practitioner write in his diagnosis yet. Bring them a perfectly simple case, and they diagnose cancer and arthritis and appendicitis and every other itis, when any really experienced surgeon could see that it's a plain case of blood poisoning. Now, it's easy for you gentlemen to talk, but what would you say if you had my practice? Except for the workmen's clubs, my patients are all clerks and shopmen. They daren't be ill. They can't afford it. And when they break down, what can I do for them? You can send your people to San Moritz or to Egypt. Champagne jelly or complete change and rest for six months. I might as well order my people a slice of the moon. And the worst of it is, I'm too poor to keep well myself on the cooking I have to put up with. I have such a wretched digestion. 
and i look it how am i to inspire confidence he sits disconsolately on the couch don't blenkinsop it's too painful the most tragic thing in the world is a sick doctor yes by george it's like a bald-headed man trying to sell a hair restorer thank god i'm a surgeon i am never sick never had a day's illness in my life that's what enables me to sympathize with my patients what you're never ill never that's interesting i believe you have no nuciform sac if you ever do feel at all queer i should very much like to have a look thank you my dear fellow but i'm too busy just now i was just telling them when you came in blenkinsop that i have worked myself out of sorts well it seems presumptuous of me to offer a prescription to a great man like you but still i have great experience and if i might recommend a pound of ripe greengages every day half an hour before lunch i'm sure you'd find a benefit they're very cheap what do you say to that b b very sensible blenkinsop very sensible indeed i am delighted to see that you disapprove of drugs mm. aha aha did i hear from the fireside armchair the bow-wow of the old school defending its drugs ah believe me patty the world would be healthier if every chemist shop in england were demolished look at the papers full of scandalous advertisements of patent medicines a huge commercial system of quackery and poison well whose fault is it ours i say ours we set the example we spread the superstition we taught the people to believe in bottles of doctor stuff and now they buy it at the stores instead of consulting a medical man quite true i've not prescribed a drug for the last fifteen years drugs can only repress symptoms they cannot eradicate disease the true remedy for all diseases is nature's remedy nature and science are at one sir patrick believe me though you were taught differently nature has provided in the white corpuscles as you call them in the phagocytes as we call them a natural means of devouring and destroying all disease germs there is at bottom only one genuinely scientific treatment for all diseases and that is to stimulate the phagocytes stimulate the phagocytes drugs are a delusion find the germ of the disease prepare from it a suitable antitoxin inject it three times a day quarter of an hour before meals and what is the result the phagocytes are stimulated they devour the disease and the patient recovers unless of course he's too far gone that i take it is the essence of riggins discovery as i sit here i seem to hear me poor old father talking again your father but lord bless my soul patty your father must have been an older man than you word for word almost he said what you say no more drugs nothing but inoculation inoculation do you mean smallpox inoculation yes in the privacy of our family circle sir my father used to declare his belief that smallpox inoculation was good not only for smallpox but for all fevers what ridgeon did you hear that sir patrick i am more struck by what you have just told me than i can well express your father sir anticipated a discovery of my own listen walpole blenkinsop attend one moment you will all be intensely interested in this i was put on the track by accident i had a typhoid case and a tetanus case side by side in the hospital a beetle and a city missionary think of what that meant for them poor fellows can a beetle be dignified with typhoid can a missionary be eloquent with lockjaw no no well i got some typhoid antitoxin from ridgeon and a tube of muldooney's anti-tetanus serum but the missionary jerked all my things off the table in one of his paroxysms and in replacing them i put ridgeon's tube where muldooney's ought to have been the consequence was that i inoculated the typhoid case for tetanus and the tetanus case for typhoid well they recovered they recovered 
except for a touch of St. Vitus's dance the missionaries as well today as ever, and the Beatles ten times the man he was. I've known things like that happen. They can't be explained. Blenkinsop, there is nothing that cannot be explained by science. What did I do? Did I fold my hands helplessly and say that the case could not be explained? By no means. I sat down and used my brains. I thought the case out on scientific principles. I asked myself, why didn't the missionary die of typhoid on top of tetanus, and the beetle of tetanus on top of typhoid? There's a problem for you, Ridgeon. Think, Sir Patrick. Reflect, Blankensop. Look at it without prejudice, Walpole. What is the real work of the antitoxin? Simply to stimulate the phagocytes. Very well, but so long as you stimulate the phagocytes, what does it matter which particular sort of serum you use for the purpose? Ha <laughs> ha! Eh, do you see? Do you grasp it? Ever since then I've used all sorts of antitoxins absolutely indiscriminately, with perfectly satisfactory results. I inoculated the little prince with your stuff, Ridgeon, because I wanted to give you a lift. But two years ago I tried the experiment of treating a scarlet fever case with a sample of hydrophobia serum from the Pasteur Institute, and it answered capitally. It stimulated the phagocytes, and the phagocytes did the rest. That is why Sir Patrick's father found that inoculation cured all fevers. It stimulated the phagocytes. Mr. Walpole, your motor's come for you. And it's frightening Sir Patrick's horses, so come along quick. Goodbye, Ridgeon. Goodbye, and many thanks. You see my point, Walpole? He can't wait, Sir Ralph. The carriage will be into the area if he don't come. I'm coming. There's nothing in your point. Phagocytosis is pure rot. The cases are all blood poisoning, and the knife is the real remedy. Bye bye, Sir Paddy. Happy to have met you, Mr. Blenkinsop. Now, Emmy. He goes out, followed by Emmy. Walpole has no intellect. A mere surgeon. Wonderful operator, but, after all, what is operating? Only manual labor. Brain. Brain remains master of the situation. The nuciform sac is utter nonsense. There's no such organ. It's a mere accidental kink in the membrane occurring in perhaps two and a half percent of the population. Of course I'm glad for Walpole's sake that the operation is fashionable, for he's a dear good fellow, and after all, as I always tell people, the operation will do them no harm. Indeed, I've known the nervous shake-up and the fortnight in bed do people a lot of good after a hard London season, but still it's a shocking fraud. Well, I must be toddling. Good-bye, Patty. Good-bye, 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 my dear Blenkinsop. Good-bye. Good-bye, Ridgeon. Don't fret about your health. You know what to do. If your liver is sluggish and little mercury never does any harm. If you feel restless, try bromide. If that doesn't answer, a stimulant, you know, a little phosphorus and strychnine. If I can't sleep, try and old, try and old, try— But no drugs, Collie. Remember that? Certainly not. Quite right, Sir Patrick. As temporary expedience, of course. But as treatment? No, no. Keep away from the chemist shop, my dear Ridgeon, whatever you do. I will. And thank you for the knighthood. Goodbye. By the way, uh, who's your patient? Who? Downstairs. Charming woman. Tuberculous husband. Is she there still? Come on, Sir Ralph. Wife's waiting in the carriage. Oh, goodbye. He goes out almost precipitately. Emmy, is that woman there still? If so, tell her once for all that I can't and won't see her. Do you hear? Oh, she ain't in a hurry. She doesn't mind how long she waits. She goes out. I must be off too. Every half hour I spend away from my work cost me eighteenpence. Uh, goodbye, Sir Patrick. Goodbye. Goodbye. Come to lunch with me some day this week. I can't afford it, dear boy. And it would put me off my own food for a week. 
thank you all the same. Can I do nothing for you? Well, if you have an old frock coat to spare. You see, what would be an old one for you would be a new one for me. So, remember the next time you turn out your wardrobe. Goodbye. He hurries out. Poor chap. Turning to Sir Patrick. So that's why they made me a knight, and that's the medical profession. And a very good profession, too, my lad, when you know as much as I know of the ignorance and superstition of the patients. You'll wonder that we're half as good as we are. We're not a profession. We're a conspiracy. All professions are conspiracies against the laity. And we can't all be geniuses like you. Every fool can get ill. But every fool can't be a good doctor. There are not enough good ones to go round. And for all you know, Bloomfield Bonington kills less people than you do. Oh, very likely. But he really ought to know the difference between a vaccine and an antitoxin. Stimulate the phagocytes. The vaccine doesn't affect the phagocytes at all. He's all wrong, hopelessly, dangerously wrong. To put a tube of serum into his hands is murder. Simple murder. Now, sir, Patrick, how long more are you going to keep them horses standing in the drought? What's that to you, you old catamaran? Oh, come, come now. None of your temper to me. And it's time for Collie to get to his work. Behave yourself, Emmy. Get out. Oh, I learned how to behave myself before I learned you to do it. I know what doctors are. Sitting talking together about themselves when they ought to be with their poor patients. And I know what horses are, Sir Patrick. I was brought up in the country. Now be good and come along. Very well, very well, very well. Goodbye, Collie. He pats Ridgen on the shoulder and goes out, turning for a moment at the door to look meditatively at Emmy, and say with grave conviction, you are an ugly old devil, and no mistake. You're no beauty yourself. They've no manners. They think they can say what they like to me. And you set them on, you do. I'll teach them their places. Here now, are you going to see that poor thing, or are you not? I tell you, for the fiftieth time, I won't see anybody. Send her away. Of being told to send her away. What good will that do her? Must I get angry with you, Emmy? Oh, come now. Just see her for a minute to please me. There's a good boy. She's given me half a crown. She thinks it's life and death to her husband for her to see you. Values her husband's life at half a crown. Well, it's all she can afford. Others think nothing of half a sovereign just to talk about themselves to you, the sluts. Besides, she'll put you in a good temper for the day, because it's a good deed to see her, and she's the sort that gets round you. Well, she hasn't done so badly. For half a crown she's had a consultation with Sir Ralph Bloomfield Bonington and Cutler Walpole. That's six guineas worth to start with. I dare say she's consulted Blankensop, too. That's another eighteen pence. Then you'll see her for me. Won't you? Oh, send her up and be hanged. Emmy trots out, satisfied. Red Penny. Red Penny, appearing at the door. What is it? There's a patient coming up. If she hasn't gone in five minutes, come in with an urgent call from the hospital for me. You understand? She's to have a strong hint to go. right -o. He vanishes. Ridgen goes to the glass and arranges his tie a little. A Mrs. Do be dad. Ridgen leaves the glass and goes to the writing table. The lady comes in. Emmy goes out and shuts the door. Ridgen, who has put on an impenetrable and rather distant professional manner, turns to the lady and invites her by a gesture to sit down on the couch. Mrs. Dubedat is beyond all demur, an arrestingly good-looking young woman. She has something of the grace and romance of a wild creature with a good deal of the elegance and dignity of a fine lady. Ridgen, who is extremely susceptible to the beauty of women, instinctively assumes the defensive at once, and hardens his manner still more. 
he has an impression that she is very well dressed, but she has a figure on which any dress would look well, and carries herself with the unaffected distinction of a woman who has never in her life suffered from those doubts and fears as to her social position which spoil the manners of most middling people. She is tall, slender, and strong, has dark hair, dressed so as to look like hair and not like a bird's nest or a pantaloon's wig, fashion wavering just then between these two models, has unexpectedly narrow, subtle, dark-fringed eyes that alter her expression disturbingly when she is excited, and flashes them wide open, is softly impetuous in her speech, and swift in her movements, and is just now in mortal anxiety. She carries a portfolio. Doctor. Wait. Before you begin, let me tell you at once that I can do nothing for you. My hands are full. I sent you that message by my old servant. You would not take that answer. How could I? You bribed her. I— That doesn't matter. She coaxed me to see you. Well, you must take it from me now that with all the good will in the world I cannot undertake another case. Doctor, you must save my husband. You must. When I explain to you, you will see that you must. It is not an ordinary case, not like any other case. He is not like anybody else in the world. Oh, believe me, he is not. I can prove it to you. I have brought some things to show you. And you can save him. The papers say you can. What's the matter? Tuberculosis? Yes. His left lung. Yes, you needn't tell me about that. You can cure him, if only you will. It is true that you can, isn't it? Oh, tell me, please. You are going to be quiet and self-possessed, aren't you? Yes. I, I beg your pardon. I know I shouldn't. Oh, please. Say that you can, and then I shall be all right. I am not a cure-monger. If you want cures, you must go to the people who sell them. But I have at the hospital ten tuberculous patients whose lives I believe I can save. Thank God. Wait a moment. Try to think of those ten patients as ten shipwrecked men on a raft, a raft that is barely large enough to save them, that will not support one more. Another head bobs up through the waves at the side. Another man begs to be taken aboard. He implores the captain of the raft to save him. But the captain can only do that by pushing one of his ten off the raft and drowning him to make room for the newcomer. That is what you are asking me to do. But how can that be? I don't understand. Surely— You must take my word for it that it is so. My laboratory, my staff, and myself are working at full pressure. We are doing our utmost. The treatment is a new one. It takes time, means, and skill, and there is not enough for another case. Our ten cases are already chosen cases. Do you understand what I mean by chosen? Chosen? No, I can't understand. You must understand. You've got to understand and to face it. In every single one of those ten cases I have had to consider not only whether the man could be saved, but whether he was worth saving. There were fifty cases to choose from, and forty had to be condemned to death. Some of the forty had young wives and helpless children. If the hardness of their cases could have saved them, they would have been saved ten times over. I've no doubt your case is a hard one. I can see the tears in your eyes. I know that you have a torrent of entreaties ready for me the moment I stop speaking, but it's no use. You must go to another doctor. But can you give me the name of another doctor who understands your secret? I have no secret. I am not a quack. I beg your pardon. I didn't mean to say anything wrong. I don't understand how to speak to you. Oh, pray, don't be offended. There, there, never mind. After all, I'm talking nonsense. I dare say I am a quack, a quack with a qualification. But my discovery is not patented. Then can any doctor cure my husband? Oh, why don't they do it? I have tried so many. I have spent so much. If only you would give me the name of another doctor. Every man in this street is a doctor. But outside myself and the handful of men I am training at St. Anne's, there is nobody as yet who has mastered the obstinate treatment, and we are full up. I'm sorry, but that is all I can say. Good morning. Mrs. Dubedat, suddenly and desperately taking some drawings from her portfolio. Doctor, look at these. 
You understand drawings. You have good ones in your waiting-room. Look at them. They are his work. It's no use my looking. He looks all the same. Hello. He takes one to the window and studies it. Yes. This is the real thing. Yes, yes. He looks at another and returns to her. These are very clever. They're unfinished, aren't they? He gets tired so soon. But you see, don't you, what a genius he is? You see that he is worth saving. Oh, doctor, I married him just to help him to begin. I had money enough to tide him over the hard years at the beginning, to enable him to follow his inspiration until his genius was recognized. And I was useful to him as a model. His drawings of me sold quite quickly. Have you got one? Only this one. It was the first. That's a wonderful drawing. Why is it called Jennifer? My name is Jennifer. A strange name. Not in Cornwall. I'm Cornish. It's only what you call Guinevere. Guinevere. Jennifer. Yes, it's really a wonderful drawing. Excuse me, but may I ask, is it for sale? I'll buy it. Oh, take it. It's my own. He gave it to me. Take it. Take them all. Take everything. Ask anything but save him. You can. You will. You must. Redpenny, entering with every sign of alarm. They've just telephoned from the hospital that you're to come instantly. A patient on the point of death. The carriage is waiting. Oh, nonsense. Get out. What do you mean by interrupting me like this? But— Chut! Can't you see I'm engaged? Be off. Redpenny, bewildered, vanishes. Mrs. Dubedat, rising. Doctor, one instant only before you go. Sit down. It's nothing. But the patient. He said he was dying. Oh, he's dead by this time. Never mind. Sit down. Mrs. Dubedat, sitting down and breaking down. Oh, you none of you care. You see people die every day. Nonsense. It's nothing. I told him to come in and say that. I thought I should want to get rid of you. Oh. Don't look so bewildered. There's nobody dying. My husband is. Ah, yes. I had forgotten your husband. Mrs. Dubedat, you are asking me to do a very serious thing? I am asking you to save the life of a great man. You are asking me to kill another man for his sake. For as surely as I undertake another case, I shall have to hand back one of the old ones to the ordinary treatment. Well, I don't shrink from that. I've had to do it before, and I will do it again, if you can convince me that his life is more important than the worst life I am now saving. But you must convince me first. He made those drawings, and they are not the best, nothing like the best, only I did not bring the really best. So few people like them. He is twenty-three. His whole life is before him. Won't you let me bring him to you? Won't you speak to him? Won't you see for yourself? Is he well enough to come to a dinner at the Star and Garter at Richmond? Oh, yes. Why? I'll tell you. I am inviting all my old friends to a dinner to celebrate my knighthood. You've seen about it in the papers, haven't you? Yes. Oh, yes. That was how I found out about you. It will be a doctor's dinner, and it was to have been a bachelor's dinner. I'm a bachelor. Now, if you will entertain for me and bring your husband, he will meet me, and he will meet some of the most eminent men in my profession, Sir Patrick Cullen, Sir Ralph Bloomfield Bonington, Cutler Walpole, and others. I can put the case to them, and your husband will have to stand or fall by what we think of him. Will you come? Yes, of course I will come. Oh, thank you, thank you. And may I bring some of his drawings, the really good ones? Yes. I will let you know the date in the course of tomorrow. Leave me your address. Thank you again and again. You have made me so happy. I know you will admire him and like him. This is my address. She gives him her card. Thank you. He rings. May I... Is there... Should I... I mean... What's the matter? Your fee for this consultation. Oh, I forgot that. Shall we say a beautiful drawing of his favorite model for the whole treatment, including the cure? You are very generous. Thank you. I know you will cure him. Goodbye. I will. Goodbye. They shake hands. By the way, you know, don't you, that tuberculosis is catching? You take every precaution, I hope? I am not likely to forget it. They treat us like lepers at the hotels. Emmy, at the door. Well, dearie, have you got round him? 
Yes, attend to the door and hold your tongue. That's a good boy. She goes out with Mrs. Dubedat. Consultation free. Cure guaranteed. <sighs> End of Act One Act Two of The Doctor's Dilemma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Doctor's Dilemma by George Bernard Shaw. Act Two. After dinner on the terrace at the Star and Garter, Richmond, cloudless summer night, nothing disturbs the stillness except from time to time the long trajectory of a distant train and the measured clucking of oars coming up from the Thames in the valley below. The dinner is over, and three of the eight chairs are empty. Sir Patrick, with his back to the view, is at the head of the square table with Ridgeon. The two chairs opposite them are empty. On their right come first a vacant chair, and then one very fully occupied by Bibi, who basks blissfully in the moonbeams. On their left, Schutzmacher and Walpole. The entrance to the hotel is on their right, behind Bibi. The five men are silently enjoying their coffee and cigarettes, full of food, and not altogether void of wine. Mrs. Dubedat, wrapped up for departure, comes in. They rise, except Sir Patrick, but she takes one of the vacant places at the foot of the table, next to Bibi, and they sit down again. Lewis will be here presently. He is showing Dr. Blenkinsop how to work the telephone. She sits. Oh, I'm so sorry we have to go. It seems such a shame, this beautiful night, and we have enjoyed ourselves so much. I don't believe another half-hour would do Mr. Dubedat a bit of harm. Come now, Cully, come, come, none of that. You take your man home, Mrs. Dubedat, and get into bed before eleven. Yes, yes, bed before eleven. Quite right, quite right. Sorry to lose you, my dear lady, but Sir Patrick's orders are the laws of, uh, of Tyre and Sidon. Let me take you home in my motor. No, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, Walpole. Your motor will take Mr. and Mrs. Dubedat to the station, and quite far enough, too, for an open carriage at night. Oh, I am sure the train is best. Well, Mrs. Dubedat, we have had a most enjoyable evening. Most enjoyable. What did you think of Lewis? Or am I wrong to ask? Wrong? Why, we are all charmed with him. Delighted. Most happy to have met him. A privilege, a real privilege. Hmm. Sir Patrick, are you uneasy about him? I admire his drawings greatly, ma'am. Yes, but I meant— You shall go away quite happy. He's worth saving. He must and shall be saved. Mrs. Dubedat rises and gasps with delight relief, and gratitude. They all rise except Sir Patrick and Schutzmacher, and come reassuringly to her. Certainly, certainly. There's no real difficulty if you only know what to do. Oh, how can I ever thank you? From this night I can begin to be happy at last. You don't know what I feel. She sits down in tears. They crowd about her to console her. My dear lady, come, 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 come. Oh, don't mind us. Have a good cry. No, don't cry. Your husband had better not know that we've been talking about him. No, of course not. Please don't mind me. What a glorious thing it must be to be a doctor. Don't laugh. You don't know what you've done for me. I never knew until now how deadly afraid I was, how I had come to dread the worst. I never dared let myself know. But now the relief has come. Now I know. Louis Dubedat comes from the hotel, in his overcoat, his throat wrapped in a shawl. He is a slim young man of twenty-three, physically still a stripling, and pretty, though not effeminate. He has turquoise-blue eyes, and a trick of looking you straight in the face with them, which, combined with a frank smile, is very engaging. Although he is all nerves, and very observant and quick of apprehension, he is not in the least shy. He is younger than Jennifer, but he patronizes her as a matter of course. The doctors do not put him out in the least. Neither Sir Patrick's years, nor Bloomfield Bonington's majesty have the smallest apparent effect on him. 
He is as natural as a cat. He moves among men as most men move among things, though he is intentionally making himself agreeable to them on this occasion. Like all people who can be depended on to take care of themselves, he is welcome company, and his artist's power of appealing to the imagination gains him credit for all sorts of qualities and powers, whether he possesses them or not. Lewis, pulling on his gloves behind Ridgeon's chair. Now, Jenny Gwynny, the motto's come around. Why do you let him spoil your beautiful name like that, Mrs. Dubedat? Oh, on grand occasions I am Jennifer. You are a bachelor. You do not understand these things, Rigan. Look at me. I also have two names. In moments of domestic worry I am simple Raff. When the sun shines in my home, I am Beetle Deedle Dumpkins. Such is married life. Mr. Dubidot, may I ask you to do me a favor before you go? Will you sign your name to this menu card, under the sketch you have made of me? Yes, and mine too, if you'll be so good. Certainly. He sits down and signs the cards. Won't you sign Dr. Schutzmacher's for him, Lewis? I don't think Dr. Schutzmacher is pleased with his portrait. I'll tear it up. No, no, if Looney doesn't want it, I do. I'll sign it for you with pleasure. He signs and hands it to Ridgeon. I've just been making a little note of the river tonight. It will work up into something good. I think I'll call it the Silver Danube. Ah, charming, charming. Very sweet. You're a nailer at pastel. <coughs> <coughs> now then, Mr. Dovedat. You've had enough for the night air. Take him home, ma'am. Yes, come, Lewis. Never fear. Never mind. I'll make that cough all right. We will stimulate the phagocytes. Good night, Mrs. Dubidat. Good night, good night. If the phagocytes fail, come to me. I'll put you right. Good night, Sir Patrick. Happy to have met you. Night. Good night, Sir Patrick. Cover yourself well up. Don't think your lungs are made of iron because they're better than his. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing hurts me. Good night. Lewis goes out through the hotel without noticing Schutzmacher. Mrs. Dubedat hesitates, then bows to him. Schutzmacher rises and bows formally, German fashion. She goes out, attended by Ridgen. The rest resume their seats, ruminating or smoking quietly. Delightful couple! Charming woman, gifted lad, remarkable talent, graceful outlines, perfect evening, great success, interesting case, glorious night, exquisite scenery, capital dinner, stimulating conversation, restful outing, good wine, happy ending, touching gratitude, lucky Ridgen. What's that, calling me, B.B.? He goes back to his seat next Sir Patrick. No, no, only congratulating you on a most successful evening. Enchanting woman, thorough breeding, gentle nature, refined— Blenkinsop comes from the hotel and takes the empty chair next Ridgeon. I'm so sorry to have left you like this, Ridgeon, but it was a telephone message from the police. They found half a milkman at our level crossing with a prescription of mine in its pocket. Where's Mr. Dubit at? Gone. Blenkinsop, rising, very pale. Gone? Just this moment. Perhaps I could overtake him. He rushes into the hotel. He's in the motor, man, miles off. You can... Ugh, no use. They're really very nice people. I confess I was afraid the husband would turn out an appalling bounder, but he's almost as charming in his way as she is in hers. And there's no mistake about his being a genius. It's something to have got a case really worth saving. Somebody else will have to go, but at all events it will be easy to find a worse man. How do you know? Come now, Sir Paddy, no growling. Have something more to drink. No, thank you. Do you see anything wrong with Dubedat, B.B.? Oh, a charming young fellow. Besides, after all, what could be wrong with him? Look at him. What could be wrong with him? There are two things that could be wrong with any man. One of them is a check, the other is a woman. Until you know that a man's sound on these two points, you know nothing about him. Ah, cynic, cynic. He's all right as to the check, for a while at all events. 
He talked to me quite frankly before dinner as to the pressure of money difficulties on an artist. He says he has no vices and is very economical, but that there's one extravagance he can't afford and yet can't resist, and that is dressing his wife prettily. So I said, bang plump out, let me lend you twenty pounds, and pay me when your ship comes home. He was really very nice about it. He took it like a man, and it was a pleasure to see how happy it made him, poor chap. But, but, but when was this, may I ask? When I joined you that time down by the river. But, my dear Walpole, he had just borrowed ten pounds from me. What? Hmm. Well, well, it was really hardly borrowing, for he said heaven only knew when he could pay me. I couldn't refuse. It appears that Mrs. Dubidot has taken a sort of fancy to me. No, it was to me. Certainly not. Your name was never mentioned between us. He is so wrapped up in his work that he has to leave her a good deal alone, and the poor innocent young fellow, he has, of course, no idea of my position or how busy I am, actually wanted me to call occasionally and talk to her. Exactly what he said to me. Pooh, 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 really, I must say. Look here, Ridgeon, this is beginning to look serious. Blankensop, very anxious and wretched, but trying to look unconcerned, comes back. Well, did you catch him? Uh, no. Excuse my running away like that. He sits down at the foot of the table, next Bloomfield Bonington's chair. Anything the matter? Oh, no. A, a trifle. Something ridiculous. It can't be helped. Never mind. Was it anything about Dubedat? I ought to keep it to myself, I know. I can't tell you, Ridgeon, how ashamed I am of dragging my miserable poverty to your dinner after all your kindness. It's not that you won't ask me again, but it's so humiliating. And I did so look forward to one evening in my dress clothes. They're still presentable, you see, with all my troubles left behind, just like old times. But what has happened? Oh, nothing. It's too ridiculous. I had just scraped up four shillings for this little outing, and it cost me one fourpence to get here. Well, Dubinat asked me to lend him half a crown to tip the chambermaid of the room his wife had left her wraps in, and for the cloak-room. He said he only wanted it for five minutes, as she had his purse. Uh, so, of course, I lent it to him, and he's forgotten to pay me. I've just tuppence to get back with. Oh, never mind that. No, I know what you're going to say, but I won't take it. I've never borrowed a penny. I never will. I've nothing left but my friends, and I won't sell them. If none of you were to be able to meet me without being afraid that my civility was leading up to the loan of five shillings, there would be an end of everything for me. I'll take your old clothes, call he, sooner than disgrace you by talking to you in the street in my own. But I won't borrow money. I'll train it as far as the tuppence will take me, and I'll tramp the rest. You'll do the whole distance in my motor. They are all greatly relieved, and Walpole hastens to get away from the painful subject by adding, Did he get anything out of you, Mr. Schutzmacher? Schutzmacher shakes his head in a most expressive negative. You didn't appreciate his drawing, I think. Oh, yes, I did. I should have liked very much to have kept the sketch and got it autographed. But why didn't you? Well, the fact is, when I joined Dubedat after his conversation with Mr. Walpole, he said the Jews were the only people who knew anything about art, and that though he had to put up with your Philistine twaddle, as he called it, it was what I said about the drawings that really pleased him. He also said that his wife was greatly struck with my knowledge, and that she always admired Jews. Then he asked me to advance him fifty pounds on the security of the drawings. No, no, positively, seriously, what? What? Another fifty? Think of that! Hmm. Of course I couldn't lend money to a stranger like that. I envy you the power to say no, Mr. Schutzmacher. Of course I knew I oughtn't to lend money to a young fellow in that way, but I simply hadn't the nerve to refuse. I couldn't very well, you know, could I? I don't understand that. I felt I couldn't very well lend it. What did he say? 
Well, he made a very uncalled-for remark about a Jew not understanding the feelings of a gentleman. I must say you Gentiles are very hard to please. You say we are no gentlemen when we lend money, and when we refuse to lend it, you say just the same. I didn't mean to behave badly. As I told him, I might have lent it to him if he had been a Jew himself. Hmm? And what did he say to that? Oh, he began trying to persuade me that he was one of the chosen people, that his artistic faculty shewed it, and that his name was as foreign as my own. He said he didn't really want fifty pounds, that he was only joking, that all he wanted was a couple of sovereigns. No, no, Mr. Schutzmacher, you invented that last touch seriously now? No, you can't improve on nature in telling stories about gentlemen like Mr. Dubedat. You certainly do stand by one another, you chosen people, Mr. Schutzmacher. Not at all. Personally, I like Englishmen better than Jews, and always associate with them. That's only natural, because as I am a Jew, there is nothing interesting in a Jew to me, whereas there is always something interesting and foreign in an Englishman. But in money matters it's quite different. You see, when an Englishman borrows, all he knows or cares is that he wants money, and he'll sign anything to get it, without in the least understanding it, or intending to carry out the agreement if it turns out badly for him. In fact, he thinks you a cad if you ask him to carry it out under such circumstances, just like the Merchant of Venice, you know. But if a Jew makes an agreement, he means to keep it, and expects you to keep it. If he wants money for a time, he borrows it, and he knows he must pay it at the end of the time. If he knows he can't pay, he begs it as a gift. Come, Looney, do you mean to say that Jews are never rogues and thieves? Oh, not at all. But I was not talking of criminals. I was comparing honest Englishmen with honest Jews. One of the hotel maids a pretty, fair-haired woman of about twenty-five, comes from the hotel, rather furtively. She accosts Ridgeon. I beg your pardon, sir. Eh? I beg your pardon, sir. It's not about the hotel. I'm not allowed to be on the terrace, and I should be discharged if I were seen speaking to you. Unless you were kind enough to say you called me to ask whether the motor has come back from the station yet. Has it? Yes, sir. Well, what do you want? Would you mind, sir? giving me the address of the gentleman that was with you at dinner. Yes, of course I should mind very much. You have no right to ask. Yes, sir. I know it looks like that. But what am I to do? What's the matter with you? Nothing, sir. I want the address, that's all. You mean the young gentleman? Yes, sir. That went to catch the train with the woman he brought with him. The woman? Do you mean the lady who dined here, the gentleman's wife? Don't believe them, sir. She can't be his wife. I'm his wife. My good girl. You his wife? What? What's that? Oh, this is getting perfectly fascinating, Ridgeon. I could run upstairs and get you my marriage lines in a minute, sir, if you doubt my word. He's Mr. Louis Dubedat, isn't he? Yes. Well, sir, you may believe me or not, but I'm the lawful Mrs. Dubedat. And why aren't you living with your husband? We couldn't afford it, sir. I had thirty pounds saved, and we spent it all on our honeymoon in three weeks, and a lot more that he borrowed. Then I had to go back into service, and he went to London to get work at his drawing, and he never wrote me a line or sent me an address. I never saw nor heard from him again until I caught sight of him from the window going off into the motor with that woman. Well, that's two wives to start with. Now, upon my soul, I don't want to be uncharitable, but really I'm beginning to suspect that our young friend is rather careless. Beginning to think. How long will it take you, man, to find out that he's a damned young blackguard? Oh, that's very severe, Sir Patrick, very severe. Of course it's bigamy, but still, he's very young, and she's very pretty. Mr. Walpole... May I sponge on you for another of those nice cigarettes of yours? Certainly. He feels in his pocket. Oh, bother. Where? I say, 
I recollect now. I passed my cigarette case to Dubedat, and he didn't return it. It was a gold one. He didn't mean any harm. He never thinks about things like that, sir. I'll get it back for you, sir, if you'll tell me where to find him. What am I to do? Shall I give her the address or not? Give her your own address, and then we'll see. You'll have to be content with that for the present, my girl. Ridgeon gives her his card. What's your name? Minnie Tinwell, sir. Well, you write him a letter to take care of this gentleman, and it will be sent on. Now be off with you. Thank you, sir. I'm sure you wouldn't see me wronged. Thank you all, gentlemen. And excuse the liberty. She goes into the hotel. Do you realize, chaps, that we have promised Mrs. Dubedat to save this fellow's life? What's the matter with him? Tuberculosis. And you can cure that? I believe so. Then I wish you'd cure me. My right lung is touched, I'm sorry to say. What? Your lung is going? My dear Blakensop, what do you tell me? Hello, you mustn't neglect this, you know. No, no, it's no use. I know what you're going to say. I've said it often to others. I can't afford to take care of myself, and there's an end of it. If a fortnight's holiday would save my life, I'd have to die. I shall get on as others have to get on. We can't all go to San Moritz or Egypt, you know, Sir Rafe. Don't talk about it. Mm. I must go. It's been a very pleasant evening, Colly. You might let me have my portrait, if you don't mind. I'll send Mr. Dubedat that couple of sovereigns for it. Ridgen, giving him the menu card. Oh, don't do that, Looney. I don't think he'd like that. Well, of course I shan't, if you feel that way about it. But I don't think you understand Dubedat. However, perhaps that's because I'm a Jew. Good night, Dr. Blenkinsop. Shaking hands. Good night, sir. I, I mean, good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night, good night, good night. Schutzmacher goes out. It's time for us all to move. Mr. Walpole, take Blinkinsop home. He's had enough of the open-air cure for tonight. Have you a thick overcoat to wear in the motor, Dr. Blinkinsop? Oh, they'll give me some brown paper in the hotel. And a few thicknesses of brown paper across the chest are better than any fur coat. Well, come along. Good night, Collie. You're coming with us, aren't you, Bibi? Yes, I'm coming. Walpole and Blenkinsop go into the hotel. Good night, my dear Riggan. Don't let us lose sight of your interesting patient and his very charming wife. We must not judge him too hastily, you know. Good night, Patty. Bless you, dear old chap. <laughs> Uh, good night, good night, good night, good night, good night, good night. He good nights himself into the hotel. The others have meanwhile gone without ceremony. Ridgen and Sir Patrick are left alone together. Ridgen, deep in thought, comes down to Sir Patrick. Well, Mr. Saviour of Lives, which is it to be? That honest, decent man, Blenkinsop, or that rotten blackguard of an artist, eh? It's not an easy case to judge, is it? Blenkinsop's an honest, decent man, but is he any use? Dubedat's a rotten blackguard, but he's a genuine source of pretty and pleasant and good things. What will he be the source of for that poor innocent wife of his when she finds him out? That's true. Her life will be a hell. And tell me this. Suppose you had this choice put before you, either to go through life and find all the pictures bad, but all the men and women good, or to go through life and find all the pictures good, and all the men and women rotten, which would you choose? That's a devilishly difficult question, Patty. The pictures are so agreeable, and the good people so infernally disagreeable and mischievous, that I really can't undertake to say offhand which I should prefer to do without. Come, come, none of your cleverness with me. I am too old for it. Blenkinsop isn't that sort of good man, a new knight. It would be simpler if Blenkinsop could paint Dubedat's pictures. It would be simpler still if Dubedat had some of Blenkinsop's honesty. The world isn't going to be made simple for you, my lad. You must take it as it is. You have to hold the scales between Blenkinsop and Dubedat. Hold them fairly. Well, I'll be as fair as I can. 
I'll put into one scale all the pounds Dubedat has borrowed, and into the other all the half-crowns that Blenkinsop hasn't borrowed. And you'll take out of Dubedat's scale all the faith he has destroyed, and all the honour he has lost, and you'll put into Blenkinsop's scale all the faith he has justified, and the honour he has created. Come, come, Paddy, none of your claptrap with me. I'm too sceptical for it. I'm not at all convinced that the world wouldn't be a better world if everybody behaved as Dubedat does, than it is now that everybody behaves as Blenkinsop does. Then why don't you behave as Dubedat does? Ah, that beats me. That's the experimental test. Still, it's a dilemma. It's a dilemma. You see, there's a complication we haven't mentioned. What's that? Well, if I let Blenkinsop die, at least nobody can say I did it because I wanted to marry his widow. Eh? What's that? Now, if I let Dubedat die, I'll marry his widow. Perhaps she would have you, you know. I have a pretty good flair for that sort of thing. I know when a woman is interested in me. She is. Well, sometimes a man knows best, and sometimes he knows worst. You'd much better kill them both. I can't. I'm at my limit. I can squeeze in one more case, but not two. I must choose. Well, you must choose as if she didn't exist. That's clear. Is that clear to you? Mind, it's not clear to me. She troubles my judgment. To me, it's a plain choice between a man and a lot of pictures. It's easier to replace a dead man than a good picture. Collie, when you live in an age that runs to pictures and statues and plays and brass bands, because its men and women are not good enough to comfort its poor aching soul, you should thank Providence that you belong to a profession which is a high and great profession, because its business is to heal and mend men and women. In short, as a member of a high and great profession, I'm to kill my patient. Don't talk wicked nonsense. You can't kill him, but you can leave him in other hands. In BB's, for instance, eh? Sir Ralph Bloomfield Bonington is a very eminent physician. He is. I'm going for my hat. Ridgeon strikes the bell as Sir Patrick makes for the hotel. A waiter comes. My bill, please. Yes, sir. End of Act Two Act Three of The Doctor's Dilemma This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Doctor's Dilemma by George Bernard Shaw Act Three In Dubedat's Studio Viewed from the large window, the outer door is in the wall on the left at the near end. The door leading to the inner rooms is in the opposite wall, at the far end. The facing wall has neither window nor door. The plaster on all the walls is uncovered and undecorated, except by scrawlings of charcoal sketches and memoranda. There is a studio throne, a chair on a dais, a little to the left, opposite the inner door, and an easel to the right, opposite the outer door, with a dilapidated chair at it. Near the easel and against the wall is a bare wooden table with bottles and jars of oil and medium paint-smudged rags, tubes of color, brushes, charcoal, a small last figure, a kettle and spirit lamp, and other odds and ends. By the table is a sofa, littered with drawing blocks, sketch-books, loose sheets of paper, newspapers, books, and more smudged rags. Next the outer door is an umbrella and hat-stand occupied partly by Lewis's hats and cloak and muffler, and partly by odds and ends of costumes. There is an old piano-stool on the near side of this door. In the corner near the inner door is a little tea-table. A lay figure, in a cardinal's robe and hat, with an hour-glass in one hand and a scythe slung on its back, smiles with inane malice at Lewis, who, in a milkman's smock much smudged with colours, is painting a piece of brocade, which he is draped about his wife. She is sitting on the throne, not interested in the painting, and appealing to him very anxiously about another matter. Promise, Lewis, putting on a touch of paint with notable skill and care, and answering quite perfunctorily. I promise, my darling. When you want money, you will always come to me. But it's so sordid, dearest. I hate money. I can't keep always bothering you for money, money, money. That's what drives me sometimes to ask other people, though I hate doing it. 
It is far better to ask me, dear. It gives people a wrong idea of you. But I want to spare your little fortune and raise money on my own work. Don't be unhappy, love. I can easily earn enough to pay it all back. I shall have a one-man show next season, and then there will be no more money troubles. Putting down his palette. There. I mustn't do any more on that till it's bone dry. So you may come down. Mrs. Dubedat, throwing off the drapery as she steps down, and revealing a plain frock of tesori silk. But you have promised, remember, seriously and faithfully, never to borrow again until you have first asked me. Seriously and faithfully. Embracing her. Ah, my love, how right you are! How much it means to me to have you by me, to guard me against living too much in the skies. On my solemn oath, from this moment forth I will never borrow another penny. Ah, that's right. Does his wicked, worrying wife torment him and drag him down from the clouds? She kisses him. And now, dear, won't you finish those drawings from McLean? Oh, they don't matter. I've got nearly all the money from him in advance. But, dearest, that is just the reason why you should finish them. He asked me the other day whether you really intended to finish them. Confound his impudence! What the devil does he take me for? Now, that just destroys all my interest in the beastly job. I've a good mind to throw up the commission and pay him back his money. We can't afford that, dear. You had better finish the drawings and have done with them. I think it is a mistake to accept money in advance. But how are we to live? Well, Lewis, it is getting hard enough as it is, now that they are all refusing to pay except on delivery. Damn those fellows. They think of nothing and care for nothing but their wretched money. Still, if they pay us, they ought to have what they pay for. There now, that's enough lecturing for today. I've promised to be good, haven't I? Putting her arms round his neck. You know that I hate lecturing, and that I don't for a moment misunderstand you, dear, don't you? I know, I know, I'm a wretch. And you're an angel. Oh, if only I were strong enough to work steadily, I'd make my darling's house a temple and her shrine a chapel more beautiful than was ever imagined. I can't pass the shops without wrestling with the temptation to go in and order all the really good things they have for you. I want nothing but you, dear. She gives him a caress, to which he responds so passionately that she disengages herself. There, be good now. Remember that the doctors are coming this morning. Isn't it extraordinarily kind of them, Lewis, to insist on coming, all of them to consult about you? Oh, I dare say they think it will be a feather in their cap to cure a rising artist. They wouldn't come if it didn't amuse them, anyhow. I say, it's not time yet, is it? No, not quite yet. Lewis, opening the door and finding Ridgeon there. Hello, Ridgeon. Delighted to see you. Come in. Shaking hands. It's so good of you to come, Doctor. Excuse this place, won't you? It's only a studio, you know. There's no real convenience for living here. But we pig along somehow, thanks to Jennifer. Now I'll run away. Perhaps later on, when you're finished with Lewis, I may come in and hear the verdict. Ridgeon bows rather constrainedly. Would you rather I didn't? Not at all, not at all. Mrs. Dubedat looks at him, a little puzzled by his formal manner, then goes into the inner room. I say, don't look so grave. There's nothing awful going to happen, is there? No. That's all right. Poor Jennifer has been looking forward to your visit more than you can imagine. She's taking quite a fancy to you, Ridgeon. The poor girl has nobody to talk to. I'm always painting. Taking up a sketch. There's a little sketch I made of her yesterday. She showed it to me a fortnight ago, when she first called on me. Oh, did she? Good Lord, how time does fly. I could have sworn I'd only just finished it. It's hard for her here, seeing me pile up drawings and nothing coming in from them. Of course, I shall sell them next year, fast enough, after my one-man show. But while the grass grows, the steed starves. I hate to have her coming to me for money, and having none to give her. But what can I do? I understood that Mrs. Dubedat had some property of her own. Oh, yes, a little, but how could a man with any decency of feeling touch that? Suppose I did, what would she have to live on if I died? I'm not insured, can't afford the premiums. How do you like that? I have not come here today to look at your drawings. I have more serious and pressing business with you. You want to sound my wretched lung. My dear Ridgeon, I'll be frank with you. 
What's the matter in this house isn't lungs, but bills. It doesn't matter about me, but Jennifer has actually to economize in the matter of food. You've made us feel that we can treat you as a friend. Will you lend us a hundred and fifty pounds? No. Why not? I am not a rich man, and I want every penny I can spare and more for my researches. You mean you'd want the money back again? I presume people sometimes have that in view when they lend money. Well, I can manage that for you. I'll give you a check. Or, see here, there's no reason why you shouldn't have your bit, too. I'll give you a check for two hundred. Why not cash the check at once without troubling me? Bless you. They wouldn't cash it. I'm overdrawn as it is. No, the way to work it is this. I'll post-date the check next October. In October, Jennifer's dividends come in. Well, you present the check. It will be returned, marked, referred to drawer, or some rubbish of that sort. Then you can take it to Jennifer, and hint that if the check isn't taken up at once, I shall be put in prison. She'll pay you like a shot. You'll clear fifty pounds, and you'll do me a real service. For I do want the money very badly, old chap, I assure you. You see no objection to the transaction, and you anticipate none from me. Well, what objection can there be? It's quite safe. I can convince you about the dividends. I mean, on the score of its being, shall I say, dishonorable? Well, of course I shouldn't suggest it if I didn't want the money. Indeed. Well, you will have to find some other means of getting it. Do you mean that you refuse? Do I mean? Of course I refuse, man. What do you take me for? How dare you make such a proposal to me? Why not? Fah! You would not understand me if I tried to explain. Now, once for all, I will not lend you a farthing. I should be glad to help your wife, but lending you money is no service to her. Oh, well, if you're earnest about helping her, I'll tell you what you might do. You might get your patients to buy some of my things, or to give me a few portrait commissions. My patients call me in as a physician, not as a commercial traveler. But you must have great influence with them. You must know such lots of things about them. Private things that they wouldn't like to have known. They wouldn't dare refuse you. Well, upon my... Lewis opens the door, and admits Sir Patrick, Sir Rafe, and Walpole. Walpole, I've been here hardly ten minutes, and already he's tried to borrow a hundred and fifty pounds from me. Then he proposed that I should get the money for him by blackmailing his wife... And you've just interrupted him in the act of suggesting that I should blackmail my patients into sitting to him for their portraits. Well, Ridgeon, if this is what you call being an honorable man, I spoke to you in confidence. We're all going to speak to you in confidence, young man. Walpole, hanging his hat on the only peg left vacant on the hat-stand. We shall make ourselves at home for half an hour, Dubedat. Don't be alarmed. You're a most fascinating chap, and we love you. Oh, all right, all right. Sit down, any way you can. Take this chair, Sir Patrick. Indicating the one on the throne. Up, Z. Helping him up, Sir Patrick grunts and enthrones himself. Here you are, B.B. Sir Rafe glares at the familiarity, but Lewis, quite undisturbed, puts a big book and a sofa cushion on the dais, on Sir Patrick's right, and B.B. sits down, under protest. Let me take your hat. He takes B.B.'s hat unceremoniously, and substitutes it for the cardinal's hat on the head of the lay figure, thereby ingeniously destroying the dignity of the conclave. He then draws the piano stool from the wall and offers it to Walpole. You don't mind this, Walpole, do you? Walpole accepts the stool and puts his hand into his pocket for his cigarette case. Missing it, he is reminded of his loss. By the way, I'll trouble you for my cigarette case, if you don't mind. What cigarette case? The gold one I lent you at the Star and Garter? Was that yours? Yes. I'm awfully sorry, old chap. I was wondering whose it was. I'm sorry to say this is all that's left of it. He hitches up his smock, produces a card from his waistcoat pocket, and hands it to Walpole. A pawn ticket? It's quite safe. He can't sell it for a year. You know. I say, my dear Walpole, I am sorry. He places his hand ingenuously on Walpole's shoulder, and looks frankly at him. Walpole, sinking on the stool with a gasp. Don't mention it. It adds to your fascination. Ridgeon, who has been standing near the easel. Before we go any further, you have a debt to pay, Mr. Dubedat. I have a precious lot of debts to pay, Ridgeon. I'll fetch you a chair. He makes for the inner door. 
Ridgeon, stopping him. You shall not leave the room until you pay it. It's a small one, and pay it you must and shall. I don't so much mind your borrowing ten pounds from one of my guests and twenty pounds from the other. I walked into it, you know. I offered it. They could afford it. But to clean poor Blenkinsop out of his last half-crown was damnable. I intend to give him that half-crown and to be in a position to pledge him my word that you paid it. I'll have that out of you, at all events. Quite right, Ridgeon, quite right. Come, young man, down with the dust, pay up. Oh, you needn't make such a fuss about it. Of course I'll pay it. I had no idea the poor fellow was hard up. I'm as shocked as any of you about it. Putting his hand into his pocket. Here you are. Finding his pocket empty. Oh, I say, I haven't any money on me just at present. Walpo, would you mind lending me half a crown just to settle this? Lend you half? Well, if you don't, Blackensop won't get it, for I haven't a wrap. You may search my pockets if you like. That's conclusive. He produces half a crown. Lewis, passing it to Ridgeon. There. I'm really glad that's settled. It was the only thing that was on my conscience. Now I hope you're all satisfied. Not quite, Mr. Dovedat. Do you happen to know a young woman named Minnie Timwell? Minnie, I should think I do, and Minnie knows me too. She's a really nice, good girl, considering her station. What's become of her? It's no use bluffing, Dubedat. We've seen Minnie's marriage lines. Indeed. Have you seen Jennifer's? Do you dare insinuate that Mrs. Dubedat is living with you without being married to you? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Yes, why not? Lots of people do it. Just as good people as you. Why don't you learn to think instead of bleating and bashing like a lot of sheep when you come up against anything you're not accustomed to? I say, I should like to draw the lot of you. You do look jolly foolish. Especially you, Ridgeon. I had you that time, you know. How, pray? Well, you set up to appreciate Jennifer, you know, and you despise me, don't you? I loathe you. He sits down again on the sofa. Just so. And yet you believe that Jennifer is a bad lot because you think I told you so. Were you lying? No, but you were smelling out a scandal instead of keeping your mind clean and wholesome. I can just play with people like you. I only asked you had you seen Jennifer's marriage lines, and you concluded straight away that she hadn't got any. You don't know a lady when you see one. What do you mean by that, may I ask? Now, I'm only an immoral artist. But if you told me that Jennifer wasn't married, I'd have had the gentlemanly feeling, an artistic instinct, to say that she carried her marriage certificate in her face and in her character. But you are all moral men, and Jennifer's only an artist's wife, probably a model, and morality consists in suspecting other people of not being legally married. Aren't you ashamed of yourselves? Can one of you look me in the face after it? It's very hard to look you in the face, Dubedat. You have such a dazzling cheek. What about Minnie Tinwell, eh? Minnie Tinwell is a young woman who has had three weeks of glorious happiness in her poor little life, which is more than most girls in her position get, I can tell you. Ask her whether she'd take it back if she could. She's got a name into history, that girl. My little sketches of her will be bought by collectors at Christie's. She'll have a page in my biography. Pretty good, that, for still-room maid at a seaside hotel, I think. What have you fellows done for her, to compare with that? We haven't trapped her into a mock marriage and deserted her. No, you wouldn't have the pluck. But don't fuss yourselves. I didn't desert little Minnie. We spent all our money. All her money? Thirty pounds? I said all our money. Hers and mine, too. Her thirty pounds didn't last three days. I had to borrow four times as much to spend on her. But I didn't grudge it, and she didn't grudge her few pounds, either. The brave little lassie. When we were cleaned out, we'd had enough of it. You can hardly suppose that we were fit company for longer than that. I, an artist, and she quite out of art and literature, and refined living and everything else. There's no desertion, no misunderstanding, no police court or divorce court sensation for you moral chaps to lick your lips over at breakfast. Which is said, well, the money's gone. We've had a good time. That can never be taken from us. So kiss, part good friends, and she back to service, and I back to my studio and my Jennifer, both the better and happier for our holiday. Quite a little poem by George. 
If you had been scientifically trained, Mr. Dubedat, you would know how very seldom an actual case bears out a principle. In medical practice, a man may die when, scientifically speaking, he ought to have lived. I have actually known a man die of a disease from which he was, scientifically speaking, immune. But that does not affect the fundamental truth of science. In just the same way, in moral cases, a man's behavior may be quite harmless and even beneficial when he is morally behaving like a scoundrel. And he may do great harm when he is morally acting on the highest principles, but that does not affect the fundamental truth of morality. And it doesn't affect the criminal law on the subject of bigamy. Oh, bigamy, bigamy, bigamy. What a fascination anything connected with the police has for you all. You moralists. I've proved to you that you were utterly wrong on the moral point. Now I'm going to show you that you are utterly wrong on the legal point. And I hope it will be a lesson for you not to be so jolly cocksure next time. A rot. You were married already when you married her, and that settles it. Does it? Why can't you think? How do you know she wasn't married already, too? Walpole, Riggan. This is beyond everything. Well, damn me. She was married to the steward of a liner. He cleared out and left her, and she thought, poor girl, that it was the law that if you hadn't heard of your husband for three years, you might marry again. So, as she was a thoroughly respectable girl, and refused to have anything to say to me unless we were married, I went through the ceremony to please her, and to preserve her self-respect. Did you tell her you were already married? Of course not. Don't you see that if she had known, she wouldn't have considered herself my wife? You don't seem to understand somehow. You let her risk imprisonment in her ignorance of the law? Well, I risked imprisonment for her sake. I could have been had up for it as much as she. But when a man makes a sacrifice for that sort of woman, he doesn't go and brag about it to her, at least not if he's a gentleman. What are we to do with this, Daisy? Oh, go and do whatever the devil you please. Put Minnie in prison, put me in prison. Kill Jennifer with the disgrace of it all. And then, when you've done all your mischief, you can go to the church and feel good about it. He's got us. He has. But is he to be allowed to defy the criminal law of the land? The criminal law is of no use to decent people. It only helps blackguards to blackmail their families. What are we family doctors doing half our time but conspiring with the family solicitor to keep some rascal out of jail and some family out of disgrace? But at least it will punish him. Oh, yes, it'll punish him. It'll punish not only him, but everybody connected with him, innocent and guilty alike. It'll throw his board and lodging on our rates and taxes for a couple of years, and then turn him loose on us, a more dangerous blackguard than ever. It'll put the girl in prison and ruin her. It'll lay his wife's life waste. You may put the criminal law out of your head once and for all. It's only fit for fools and savages. Would you mind turning your face a little more this way, Sir Patrick? Sir Patrick turns indignantly and glares at him. Oh, that's too much. Put down your foolish pencil, man, and think of your position. You can defy the laws made by men, but there are other laws to reckon with. Do you know you're going to die? We're all going to die, aren't we? We're not all going to die in six months. How do you know? This, for Bibi, is the last straw. He completely loses his temper and begins to walk excitedly about. Upon my soul, I will not stand this. It is in questionable taste under any circumstances, or in any company, to harp on the subject of death. But it is a dastardly advantage to take of a medical man. I will not allow it. Do you hear? Well, I didn't begin it. You chaps did. It's always the way with the inartistic professions. When they're beaten in the argument, they fall back on intimidation. I never knew a lawyer who didn't threaten to put me in prison sooner or later. I never knew a parson who didn't threaten me with damnation. And now you threaten me with death. With all your talk, you've only one real trump in your hand, and that's intimidation. Well, I'm not a coward, so it's no use with me. I'll tell you what you are, sir. You were a scoundrel. Oh, I don't mind you calling me a scoundrel a bit. It's only a word, a word that you don't know the meaning of. What is a scoundrel? You are a scoundrel, sir. Just so. What is a scoundrel? I am. 
What am I? A scoundrel. It's just arguing in a circle. And you imagine you're a man of science. I... 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 I, I, I have a good mind to take you by the scruff of your neck, you infamous rascal, and give you a sound thrashing. I wish you would. You'd pay me something handsome to keep it out of court afterwards. B.B., baffled, flings away from him with a snort. Have you any more civilities to address to me in my own house? I should like to get them over before my wife comes back. He resumes his sketching. My mind's made up. When the law breaks down, honest men must find a remedy for themselves. I will not lift a finger to save this reptile. That is the word I was trying to remember. Reptile. I can't help rather liking you, Dubedat. But you certainly are a thoroughgoing specimen. You know our opinion of you now, at all events. Look here. All this is no good. You don't understand. You imagine that I'm simply an ordinary criminal. Not an ordinary one, Dubedat. Do yourself justice. Well, you're on the wrong track altogether. I'm not a criminal. All your moralizings have no value for me. I don't believe in morality. I'm a disciple of Bernard Shaw. Eh? B.B., waving his hand as if the subject was now disposed of. That's enough. I wish to hear no more. Of course, I haven't the ridiculous vanity to set up to be exactly a superman. But still, it's an ideal that I strive towards just as any other man strives towards his ideal. Don't trouble to explain. I now understand you perfectly. Say no more, please. When a man pretends to discuss science, morals, and religion, and then avows himself a follower of a notorious and avowed anti-vaccinationist, there is nothing more to be said. Not, my dear Ridgeon, that I believe in vaccination in the popular sense any more than you do. I needn't tell you that. But there are things that place a man socially, and anti-vaccination is one of them. He resumes his seat on the dais. Bernard Shaw? I've never heard of him. He's a Methodist preacher, I suppose. No, no. He's the most advanced man now living. He isn't anything. I assure you, young man, my father learnt the doctrine of deliverance from sin from John Wesley's own lips before you or Mr. Shaw were born. It used to be very popular as an excuse for putting sand in sugar and water in milk. It was sound Methodist, my lad, only you don't know it. It's an intellectual insult. I don't believe there's such a thing as sin. Well, sir, there are people who don't believe there's such a thing as disease, either. They call themselves Christian scientists, I believe. They'll just suit your complaint. We can do nothing for you. He rises. Good afternoon to you. Lewis, running to him piteously. Oh, don't get up, Sir Patrick. Don't go, please don't. I didn't mean to shock you on my word. Do sit down again. Give me another chance. Two minutes more. That's all I ask. Sir Patrick, surprised by this sign of grace, and a little touched. Well... He sits down. Thanks awfully. I don't mind giving you two minutes more, but don't address yourself to me, for I've retired from practice, and I don't pretend to be able to cure your complaint. Your life is in the hands of these gentlemen. Not in mine. My hands are full. I have no time and no means available for this case. What do you say, Mr. Walpole? Oh, I'll take him in hand. I don't mind. I feel perfectly convinced that this is not a moral case at all. It's a physical one. There's something abnormal about his brain. That means probably some morbid condition affecting the spinal cord. And that means the circulation. In short, it's clear to me that he's suffering from an obscure form of blood poisoning, which is almost certainly due to an accumulation of ptomaines in his new form sac. I'll remove the sac. Do you mean operate on me? Oh, no, thank you. Never fear, you won't feel anything. You'll be under an anaesthetic, of course. And it will be extraordinarily interesting. Oh, well, if it would interest you and it won't hurt, that's another matter. How much will you give me to let you do it? Walpole, rising indignantly. How much? What do you mean? Well, you don't expect me to let you cut me up for nothing, do you? Will you paint my portrait for nothing? No, but I'll give you the portrait when it's painted, and you can sell it afterwards for perhaps double the money. But I can't sell my nuciform sack when you've cut it out. Ridgen. Did you ever hear anything like this? Well, 
You can keep your nuciform sac, and your tubercular lung, and your diseased brain. I've done with you. One would think I was not conferring a favour on the fellow. He returns to his stool in high dudgeon. That leaves only one medical man who has not withdrawn from your case, Mr. Dubedat. You have nobody left to appeal to now but Sir Ralph Bloomfield Bonington. If I were you, Beebe, I wouldn't touch him with a pair of tongs. Let him take his lungs to the Brompton Hospital. They won't cure him, but they'll teach him manners. My weakness is that I have never been able to say no, even to the most thoroughly undeserving people. Besides, I am bound to say that I don't think it is possible, in medical practice, to go into the question of the value of the lives we save. Just consider, Ridgeon. Let me put it to you, Patty. Clear your mind of Kant, Walpole. My mind is clear of Kant. Quite so. Well, now, look at my practice. It is what I suppose you would call a fashionable practice, a smart practice, a practice among the best people. You ask me to go into the question of whether my patients are of any use either to themselves or anyone else. Well, if you apply any scientific test known to me, you will achieve a reductio ad absurdum. You will be driven to the conclusion that the majority of them would be, as my friend Mr. J. M. Barry has tersely phrased it, better dead. Better dead. There are exceptions, no doubt. For instance, there is the court, an essential social democratic institution, supported out of public funds by the public because the public wants it and likes it. My court patients are hard-working people who give satisfaction undoubtedly. Then I have a duke or two whose estates are probably better managed than they would be in public hands. But as to most of the rest, if I once began to argue about them, unquestionably the verdict would be, better dead. When they actually do die, I sometimes have to offer that consolation, thinly disguised, to the family. The fact that they spend money so extravagantly on medical attendance really would not justify me in wasting my talents, such as they are, in keeping them alive. After all, if my fees are high, I have to spend heavily. My own tastes are simple. A camp bed, a couple of rooms, a crust, a bottle of wine, and I am happy and contented. My wife's tastes are perhaps more luxurious, but even she deplores an expenditure the sole object of which is to maintain the state my patients require from their medical attendant. The, uh, 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 I have lost the thread of these remarks. What was I talking about, Riggan? About Dubedat. Ah, uh, yes, precisely. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dubedat, of course. Well, what is our friend Dubedat? A vicious and ignorant young man with a talent for drawing. Thank you. Don't mind me. But then, what are many of my patients? Vicious and ignorant young men, without a talent for anything. If I were to stop to argue about their merits, I should have to give up three-quarters of my practice. Therefore, I have made it a rule not to so argue. Now, as an honorable man, having made that rule as to paying patients, can I make an exception as to a patient who, far from being a paying patient, may more fitly be described as a borrowing patient? No, I say no, Mr. Dubidot. Your moral character is nothing to me. I look at you from a purely scientific point of view. To me you are simply a field of battle in which an invading army of tubercul bacilli struggles with a patriotic force of phagocytes. Having made a promise to your wife, which my principles will not allow me to break, to stimulate those phagocytes, I will stimulate them. And I take no further responsibility. He digs himself back in his seat, exhausted. Well, Mr. Dubedat, as Sir Ralph has very kindly offered to take charge of your case, and as the two minutes I promised you are up, I must ask you to excuse me. Oh, certainly, I've quite done with you. Rising and holding up the sketchbook. There. While you've been talking, I've been doing. What is there left of your moralizing? Only a little carbonic acid gas, which makes the room unhealthy. What is there left of my work? That. Look at it. Ridgeon rises to look at it. Sir Patrick, 
who has come down to him from the throne. You young rascal! Was it during me you were? Of course, what else? Sir Patrick takes the drawing from him and grunts approvingly. That's rather good. Don't you think so, Lolly? Yes, so good that I should like to have it. Thank you, but I should like to have it myself. What do you think, Walpole? Walpole rising and coming over to look. No, by Jove, I must have this. I wish I could afford to give it to you, Sir Patrick, but I'd pay five guineas sooner than part with it. Oh, for that matter, I will give you six for it. Ten. I think Sir Patrick is morally entitled to it, as he sat for it. May I send it to your house, Sir Patrick, for twelve guineas? Twelve guineas? Not if you are president of the Royal Academy, young man. Would you like to take it at twelve, Sir Ralph? B.B. coming between Lewis and Walpole. Twelve guineas? Uh, thank you. I'll take it at that. He takes it and presents it to Sir Patrick. Accept it from me, Patty, and may you long be spared to contemplate it. Thank you. He puts the drawing into his hat. I needn't settle with you now, Mr. Dubedat. My fees will come to more than that. He also retrieves his hat. Well, of all the mean, I'd let myself be shot sooner than do a thing like that. I consider you've stolen that drawing. So we've converted you to a belief in morality after all, eh? Yea. I'll do another one for you, Walpole, if you'll let me have the ten you promised. Very good. I'll pay on delivery. Oh, what do you take me for? Have you no confidence in my honour? None whatever. Oh, well. Of course, if you feel that way. You can't help it. Before you go, Sir Patrick, let me fetch Jennifer. I know she'd like to see you, if you don't mind. And now, before she comes in, one word. You've all been talking here pretty freely about me. In my own house, too. I don't mind that. I'm a man, and I can take care of myself. But when Jennifer comes in, please remember that she's a lady, and that you are supposed to be gentlemen. He goes out. Well! He gives the situation up as indescribable, and goes for his hat. Damn his impudence! I shouldn't be at all surprised to learn that he's well-connected. Whenever I meet dignity and self-possession without any discoverable basis, I diagnose good family. Diagnose artistic genius, B.B. That's what saves his self-respect. The world is made like that. The decent fellows are always being lectured and put out of countenance by the snobs. I am not out of countenance. I should like, by Jupiter, to see the man who could put me out of countenance. Jennifer comes in. Ah, Mrs. Dubidot, and how are we today? Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Sir Patrick. Oh, life has been worth living since I have known you. Since Richmond I have not known a moment's fear, and it used to be nothing but fear. Won't you sit down and tell me the result of the consultation? I'll go, if you don't mind, Mrs. Dubidat. I have an appointment. Before I go, let me say that I am quite agreed with my colleagues here as to the character of the case. As to the cause and the remedy, that's not my business. I'm only a surgeon, and these gentlemen are physicians and will advise you. I may have my own views. In fact, I have them, and they are perfectly well known to my colleagues. If I am needed, and needed I shall be finally, they know where to find me, and I am always at your service. So, for to-day, good-bye." He goes out, leaving Jennifer much puzzled by his unexpected withdrawal and formal manner. "'I also will ask you to excuse me, Mrs. Dubedat. "'Are you going?' "'Yes. I can be no use here, and I must be getting back. As you know, ma'am, I am not in practice now, and I shall not be in charge of the case. It rests between Sir Colenso Region and Sir Ralph Bloomfield Bonington. They know my opinion. Good afternoon to you, ma'am. He bows and makes for the door. Mrs. Dubedat, detaining him. There's nothing wrong, is there? You don't think Lewis is worse, do you? No, he's not worse. Just the same as at Richmond. Oh, thank you. You frightened me. Excuse me. Don't mention it, ma'am. He goes out. Now, Mrs. Dubidat, if I am to take the patient in hand— You? But I thought that Sir Colenso— Bibi, beaming with the conviction that he is giving her a most gratifying surprise. My dear lady, your husband shall have me. But— Not a word. It is a pleasure to me for your sake. 
Sir Colenso Riggan will be in his proper place in the bacteriological laboratory. I shall be in my proper place at the bedside. Your husband shall be treated exactly as if he were a member of the royal family. No gratitude. It would embarrass me, I assure you. Now may I ask whether you are particularly tied to these apartments? Of course, the motor has annihilated distance, but I confess that if you are rather nearer to me, it would be a little more convenient. You see, this studio and flat are self-contained. I have suffered so much in lodgings. The servants are so frightfully dishonest. Ah, are they, are they? Dear me. I was never accustomed to lock things up, and I missed so many small sums. At last a dreadful thing happened. I missed a five-pound note. It was traced to the housemaid, and she actually said Lewis had given it to her, and he wouldn't let me do anything. He is so sensitive that these things drive him mad. Ah, oh, hmm, uh, yes, uh, say no more, Mrs. Dupidot, you shall not move. If the mountain will not come to Mohammed, Mohammed must come to the mountain. Now I must be off. I will write and make an appointment. We shall begin stimulating the phagocytes on, on, probably on Tuesday next. But I will let you know. Depend on me. Don't fret. Eat regularly. Sleep well. Keep your spirits up. Keep the patient cheerful. Hope for the best. No tonic like a charming woman. No medicine like cheerfulness. No resource like science. Good-bye, good-bye, good-bye. On Tuesday morning, send me down a tube of some really stiff antitoxin. Any kind will do. Don't forget. Good-bye, Kali. He goes out. You look quite discouraged again. She is almost in tears. What's the matter? Are you disappointed? I know I ought to be very grateful. Believe me, I am very grateful, but... but... Well? I had set my heart your curing, Lewis. Well, Sir Rafe Bloomfield Bonington. Yes, I know, I know. It is a great privilege to have him. But, oh, I wish it had been you. I know it's unreasonable. I can't explain. But I had such a strong instinct that you would cure him. I don't... I can't feel the same about Sir Ralph. You promised me. Why did you give Lewis up? I explained to you. I cannot take another case. But at Richmond... At Richmond I thought I could make room for one more case. But my old friend Dr. Blenkinsop claimed that place. His lung is attacked. Do you mean that elderly man? That rather— I mean the gentleman that dined with us, an excellent and honest man, whose life is as valuable as anyone else's. I have arranged that I shall take his case, and that Sir Ralph Bloomfield Bonington shall take Mr. Dubedat's. I see what it is. Oh, it is envious, mean, cruel. And I thought that you would be above such a thing. What do you mean? Oh, do you think I don't know? Do you think it has never happened before? Why does everybody turn against him? Can you not forgive him for being superior to you, for being cleverer, for being braver, for being a great artist? Yes, I can forgive him for all that. Well, have you anything to say against him? I have challenged everyone who has turned against him. Challenged them face to face to tell me any wrong thing he has done, any ignoble thought he has uttered. They have always confessed that they could not tell me one. I challenge you now. What do you accuse him of? I am like all the rest. Face to face I cannot tell you one thing against him. But your manner is changed, and you have broken your promise to me to make room for him as your patient. I think you are a little unreasonable. You have had the very best medical advice in London for him, and his case has been taken in hand by a leader of the profession, surely. Oh, it is so cruel to keep telling me that. It seems all right, and it puts me in the wrong. But I am not in the wrong. I have faith in you, and I have no faith in the others. We have seen so many doctors. I have come to know at last when they are only talking and can do nothing. It is different with you. I feel that you know. You must listen to me, doctor. Am I offending you by calling you doctor instead of remembering your title? Nonsense. I am a doctor. But mind you, don't call Walpole one. I don't care about Mr. Walpole. It is you who must befriend me. Oh, will you please sit down and listen to me just for a few minutes? He assents with grave inclination, and sits on the sofa. 
She sits on the easel chair. Thank you. I won't keep you long, but I must tell you the whole truth. Listen, I know Louis as nobody else in the world knows him or ever can know him. I am his wife. I know he has little faults, impatiences, sensitivenesses, even little selfishnesses that are too trivial for him to notice. I know that he sometimes shocks people about money, because he is so utterly above it and can't understand the value ordinary people set on it. Tell me, did he... did he borrow any money from you? He asked me for some once. Oh, I'm so sorry. So sorry. But he will never do it again. I pledge you my word for that. He has given me his promise, here in this room, just before you came, and he is incapable of breaking his word. That was his only real weakness, and now it is conquered and done with for ever. Was that really his only weakness? He is perhaps sometimes weak about women, because they adore him so and are always laying traps for him. And of course when he says he doesn't believe in morality, ordinary pious people think he must be wicked. You can understand, can't you, how all this starts a great deal of gossip about him, and gets repeated until even good friends get set against him. Yes, I understand. Oh, if you only knew the other side of him as I do. Do you know, Doctor, that if Lewis honoured himself by a really bad action, I should kill myself? Come, don't exaggerate. I should. You don't understand that, you East Country people. You did not see much of the world in Cornwall, did you? Oh, yes. I saw a great deal every day of the beauty of the world, more than you ever see here in London. But I saw very few people, if that is what you mean. I was an only child. That explains a good deal. I had a great many dreams. But at last they all came to one dream. Yes, the usual dream. Is it usual? As I guess. You haven't yet told me what it was. I didn't want to waste myself. I could do nothing myself, but I had a little property and I could help with it. I had even a little beauty. Don't think me vain for knowing it. I always had a terrible struggle with poverty and neglect at first. My dream was to save one of them from that, and bring some charm and happiness into his life. I prayed heaven to send me one. I firmly believe that Lewis was guided to me in answer to my prayer. He was no more like the other men I had met than the Thames Embankment is like our Cornish coasts. He saw everything that I saw and drew it for me. He understood everything. He came to me like a child. Only fancy, Doctor. He never even wanted to marry me. He never thought of the things other men think of. I had to propose it myself. Then he said he had no money. When I told him I had some, he said, Oh, all right, just like a boy. He is still like that, quite unspoiled, a man in his thoughts, a great poet and artist in his dreams, and a child in his ways. I gave him myself, and all I had, that he might grow to his full height with plenty of sunshine. If I lost faith in him, it would mean the wreck and failure of my life. I should go back to Cornwall and die. I could show you the very cliff I should jump off. You must cure him. You must make him quite well again for me. I know that you can do it and that nobody else can. I implore you not to refuse what I am going to ask you to do. Take Lewis yourself, and let Sir Ralph cure Dr. Blenkinsop. Mrs. Dubedat, do you really believe in my knowledge and skill as you say you do? Absolutely. I do not give my trust by halves. I know that. Well, I am going to test you, hard. Will you believe me when I tell you that I understand what you have just told me, that I have no desire but to serve you in the most faithful friendship, and that your hero must be preserved to you? Oh, forgive me. Forgive what I said. You will preserve him to me. At all hazards. She kisses his hand. He rises hastily. No, you have not heard the rest. She rises, too. You must believe me when I tell you that the one chance of preserving the hero lies in Lewis being in the care of Sir Rafe. You say so. I have no more doubt. I believe you. Thank you. Goodbye. 
She takes his hand. I hope this will be a lasting friendship. It will. My friendships end only with death. Death ends everything, doesn't it? Goodbye. With a sigh and a look of pity at her which she does not understand, he goes. End of Act Three Act Four of The Doctor's Dilemma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Doctor's Dilemma by George Bernard Shaw. Act Four The Studio. The easel is pushed back to the wall. Cardinal Death, holding his scythe and hourglass like a sceptre and globe, sits on the throne. On the hat stand hangs the hats of Sir Patrick and Bloomfield Bonington. Walpole, just come in, is hanging up his beside them. There is a knock. He opens the door and finds Ridgeon there. Hello, Ridgeon. They come into the middle of the room together, taking off their gloves. What's the matter? Have you been sent for, too? We've all been sent for. I've only just come. I haven't seen him yet. The charwoman says that old Patty Cullen has been here with Beebe for the last half hour. Sir Patrick, with bad news in his face, enters from the inner room. Well, what's up? Go in and see. B. B. is in there with him. Walpole goes. Ridgeon is about to follow him, but Sir Patrick stops him with a look. What has happened? Do you remember Jean Marsh's arm? Is that what's happened? That's what's happened. His lung has gone like Jean's arm. Oh, he never saw such a case. He has got through three months' galloping consumption in three days. B. B. got in on the negative phase. Negative or positive, the lad's done for. He won't last out the afternoon. He'll go suddenly, or you've often seen it. So long as he goes before his wife finds him out, I don't care. I fully expected this. It's a little hard on a lad to be killed because his wife has too high an opinion of him. Fortunately, few of us are in any danger of that. Sir Rafe comes from the inner room and hastens between them, humanely concerned, but professionally elated and communicative. Ah, here you are, Riggan. Patty's told you, of course. Yes. It's an enormously interesting case. You know, Collie, by Jupiter, if I didn't know, as a matter of scientific fact, that I'd been stimulating the phagocytes, I should say I'd been stimulating the other things. What is the explanation of it, Sir Patrick? How do you account for it, Riggan? Have we overstimulated the phagocytes? Have they not only eaten up the bacilli, but attacked and destroyed the red corpuscles as well? A possibility, suggested by the patient's pallor. Nay, have they finally begun to prey on the lungs themselves, or on one another? I shall write a paper about this case. Walpole comes back, very serious, even shocked. He comes between Beebe and Ridgeon. Phew! Beebe! You've done it this time. What do you mean? Killed him. The worst case of neglected blood poisoning I ever saw. It's too late now to do anything. He'd die under the anaesthetic. Killed? Really, Walpole? If your monomania were not well known, I should take such an expression very seriously. Come, come. When you've both killed as many people as I have in my time, you'll feel humble enough about it. Come and look at him, Cully. Ridgeon and Sir Patrick go into the inner room. I apologize, Beebe, but it's blood poisoning. My dear Walpole, everything is blood poisoning. But upon my soul, I shall not use any of that stuff of Riggins again. What made me so sensitive about what you said just now is that, strictly between ourselves, Riggin cooked our young friend's goose. Jennifer, worried and distressed, but always gentle, comes between them from the inner room. She wears a nurse's apron. Sir Ralph, what am I to do? That man who insisted on seeing me, and sent in word that business was important to Lewis, is a newspaper man. A paragraph appeared in the paper this morning saying that Lewis is seriously ill, and this man wants to interview him about it. How can people be so brutally callous? Walpole, moving vengefully towards the door. You just leave me to deal with him. But Lewis insists on seeing him. He almost began to cry about it. And he says he can't bear his room any longer. 
He says he wants to—to to die in his studio. Sir Patrick says let him have his way. It can do no harm. What shall we do? Why, follow Sir Patrick's excellent advice, of course. As he says, it can do him no harm, and it will no doubt do him good, a great deal of good. He will be much the better for it. Will you bring the man up here, Mr. Walpole, and tell him that he may see Lewis, but that he mustn't exhaust him by talking? Sir Ralph, don't be angry with me, but Lewis will die if he stays here. I must take him to Cornwall. He will recover there. Cornwall, the very place for him, wonderful for the lungs. Stupid of me not to think of it before. You are his best physician after all, dear lady. An inspiration, Cornwall, of course, yes, yes, yes. You are so kind, Sir Ralph. But don't give me much, or I shall cry, and Lewis can't bear that. Then let us come back to him and help to carry him in. Cornwall, of course, of course, the very thing. They go together into the bedroom. Walpole returns with the newspaper man, a cheerful, affable young man, who is disabled for ordinary business pursuits by a congenital erroneousness which renders him incapable of describing accurately anything he sees, or understanding or reporting accurately anything he hears. As the only employment in which these defects do not matter is journalism, for a newspaper, not having to act on its description and reports, but only to sell them to idly curious people, has nothing but honour to lose by inaccuracy and unveracity, he has perforce become a journalist, and has to keep up an air of high spirits through a daily struggle with his own illiteracy and the precariousness of his employment. He has a notebook, and occasionally attempts to make a note, but as he cannot write shorthand, and does not write with ease in any hand, he generally gives it up as a bad job before he succeeds in finishing a sentence. The newspaper man, looking round and making indecisive attempts at notes. This is the studio, I suppose? Yes. Where he has his models, eh? No doubt. Cubicle, you said it was? Yes, tubercle. Which way do you spell it? Is it C-U-B-I-C-A-L or C-L-E? Tubercle, man, not cubicle. T-U-B-E-R-C-L-E. -E. Oh, tubercle. Some disease, I suppose. I thought he had consumption. Are you one of the family, or the doctor? I am neither one nor the other. I am Mr. Cutler Walpole. Put that down. Then put down Sir Colenso Ridgeon. Pigeon? Ridgeon. Contemptuously snatching his book. Here. You'd better let me write the names down for you. You're sure to get them wrong. That comes of belonging to an illiterate profession, with no qualifications and no public register. He writes the particulars. Oh, I say, you have got your knife into us, haven't you? I wish I had. I'd make a better man of you. Now attend. Showing him the book. These are the names of the three doctors. This is the patient. This is the address. This is the name of the disease. He shuts the book with a snap which makes the journalist blink, and returns it to him. Mr. Dubedat will be brought in here presently. He wants to see you because he doesn't know how bad he is. We'll allow you to wait a few minutes to humour him. But if you talk to him, out you go. He may die at any moment. Is he as bad as that? I say, I am in luck today. Would you mind letting me photograph you? He produces a camera. Could you have a lancet or something in your hand? Put it up. If you want my photograph, you can get it in Baker Street in any of the series of celebrities. But they'll want to be paid, if you wouldn't mind. I would. Put it up, I tell you. Sit down there and be quiet. The newspaper man quickly sits down on the piano stool as Dubedat, in an invalid's chair, is wheeled in by Mrs. Dubedat and Sir Rafe. They place the chair between the dais and the sofa, where the easel stood before. Lewis is not changed, as a robust man would be, and he is not scared. His eyes look larger, and he is so weak physically that he can hardly move, lying on his cushions with complete languor. But his mind is active. It is making the most of his condition, finding voluptuousness in languor and drama in death. They are all impressed, in spite of themselves, except Ridgeon, who is implacable. Beebe is entirely sympathetic and forgiving. Ridgeon follows the chair with a tray of milk and stimulants. Sir Patrick, who accompanies him, 
takes the tea-table from the corner and places it behind the chair for the tray. B.B. takes the easel-chair and places it for Jennifer at Dubedat's side, next the dais, from which the lay figure ogles the dying artist. B.B. then returns to Dubedat's left. Jennifer sits. Walpole sits down on the edge of the dais. Ridgen stands near him. That's happiness. To be in the studio, happiness. Yes, dear. Sir Patrick says you may stay here as long as you like. Jennifer? Yes, my darling? Is the newspaper man here? Yes, Mr. Dubedat. I'm here at your service. I represent the press. I thought you might like to let us have a few words about... about... Uh, well, a few words on your illness and your plans for the season. My plans for the season are very simple. I'm going to die. Louis, dearest. My darling, I'm very weak and tired. Don't put on me the horrible strain of pretending that I don't know. I've been lying there listening to the doctors, laughing to myself. They know, dearest, don't cry. It makes you ugly, and I can't bear that. She dries her eyes and recovers herself with a proud effort. I want you to promise me something. Yes, yes, you know I will. Only, my love, my love, don't talk. It will waste your strength. No, it will only use it up. Ridgen, give me something to keep me going for a few minutes. One of your confounded antitoxins, if you don't mind. I have something to say before I go. I suppose it can do no harm. He pours out some spirit, and is about to add soda water, when Sir Patrick corrects him. In milk, don't sit him coughing. Jennifer. Yes, dear. If there's one thing I hate more than another, it's a widow. Promise me you'll never be a widow. My dear, what do you mean? I want you to look beautiful. I want people to see in your eyes that you were married to me. The people in Italy used to point at Dante and say, There goes the man who has been in hell. I want them to point at you and say, There goes a woman who has been in heaven. It has been heaven, darling, hasn't it, sometimes? Oh, yes, yes. Always. Always. If you wear black and cry, people will say, Look at that miserable woman. Her husband made her miserable. No, never. You are the light and the blessing of my life. I never lived until I knew you. Then you must always wear beautiful dresses and splendid magic jewels. Think of all the wonderful pictures I shall never paint. Well, you must be transfigured with all the beauty of those pictures. Men must get such dreams from seeing you as they never could get from any daubing with paint and brushes. Painters must paint you as they never painted any mortal woman before. There must be a great tradition of beauty, a great atmosphere of wonder and romance. That is what men must always think of when they think of me. That is the sort of immortality I want. You can make that for me, Jennifer. There are lots of things you don't understand, that every woman in the street understands. But you can understand that, and do it as nobody else can. Promise me that immortality. Promise me you will never make a little hell of crape and crying, and undertaker's horrors and withering flowers and all that vulgar rubbish. I promise. But all that is far off, dear. You are to come to Cornwall with me and get well. Sir Ralph says so. Poor old B.B. Poor fellow. Brain going. Sir Patrick's there, isn't he? Yes, yes, I'm here. Sit down, won't you? It's a shame to keep you standing about. Yes, yes. Thank you. All right. Jennifer? Yes, dear. Do you remember the burning bush? Yes, yes. Oh, my dear. How it strains my heart to remember it now. Does it? It fills me with joy. Tell them about it. It was nothing. Only that once in my old Cornish home we lit the first fire of the winter. And when we looked through the window, we saw the flames dancing in a bush in the garden. Such a color, garnet color, waving like silk, liquid lovely flame flowing up through the bay leaves, and not burning them. Well, I shall be a flame like that. I'm sorry to disappoint the poor little worms, but the last of me shall be the flame in the burning bush. Whenever you see the flame, Jennifer, that will be me. Promise me that I shall be burnt. Oh, if I might be with you, Lewis. No, you must always be in the garden when the bush flames. 
You are my hold on the world. You are my immortality. Promise. I'm listening. I shall not forget. You know that I promise. Well, that's about all. Except that you are to hang my pictures at the one-man show. I can trust your eye. You won't let anyone else touch them. You can trust me. Then there's nothing more to worry about, is there? Give me some more of that milk. I'm fearfully tired. But if I stop talking, I shan't begin again. Sir Rafe gives him a drink. He takes it and looks up quaintly. I say, B.B., do you think anything would stop you talking? He confuses me with you, Patty. Poor fellow, poor fellow. I used to be awfully afraid of death. But now it's come, and I have no fear. And I'm perfectly happy, Jennifer. Yes, dear. I'll tell you a secret. I used to think that our marriage was all an affectation, and that I'd break loose and run away some day. But now that I'm going to be broken loose, whether I like it or not, I'm perfectly fond of you, and perfectly satisfied because I'm going to live as part of you, and not as my troublesome self. Stay with me, Louis. Oh, don't leave me, dearest. Not that I'm selfish, with all my faults. I don't think I've ever been really selfish. No artist can. Art is too large for that. You will marry again, Jennifer. Oh, how can you, Louis? Yes, because people who have found marriage happy always marry again. Ah, uh, I shan't be jealous. But don't talk to the other fellow too much about me. He won't like it. I shall be your lover all the time. But it will be a secret from him, poor devil. Come, you've talked enough. Tried the rest a while. Yes, I'm fearfully tired, but I shall have a long rest presently. I have something to say to you fellows. You're all there, aren't you? I'm too weak to see anything but Jennifer's bosom. That promises rest. We are all here. That voice sounded devilish. Take care, Ridgeon. My ears hear things that other people's can't. I've been thinking, thinking. I'm cleverer than you imagine. You've got any nerves, Gully. Slip out quietly. Would you deprive the dying actor of his audience? I heard that, Ridgeon. That was good. Jennifer, dear, be kind to Ridgeon always, because he was the last man who amused me. Was I? But it's not true. It's you who are still on the stage. I'm halfway home already. What did you say? Nothing, dear. Only one of those little secrets that men keep among themselves. Well, all you chaps have thought pretty hard things of me and said them. No, no, Dubidot, not at all. Yes, you have. I know what you all think of me. Don't imagine I'm sore about it. I forgive you. Well, damn me. I beg your pardon. That was old Walpole, I know. Don't grieve, Walpole. I'm perfectly happy. I'm not in pain. I don't want to live. I've escaped from myself. I'm in heaven, immortal in the heart of my beautiful Jennifer. I'm not afraid. I'm not ashamed. I know that in an accidental sort of way, struggling through the unreal part of life, I haven't always been able to live up to my ideal. In my own real world, I have never done anything wrong, never denied my faith, never been untrue to myself. I've been threatened and blackmailed and insulted and starved. But I've played the game. I've fought the good fight. And now it's all over. There's an indescribable peace. I believe in Michelangelo, Velasquez, and Rembrandt, in the might of design, the mystery of color, the redemption of all things by beauty everlasting, in the message of art that has made these hands blessed. Amen. Amen. He closes his eyes and lies still. Louis, are you— Walpole rises and comes quickly to see whether he is dead. Not yet, dear. Very nearly, but not yet. I should like to rest my head on your bosom, only it would tire you. No, 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 darling. How could you tire me? She lifts him so that he lies on her bosom. That's good. That's real. Don't spare me, dear. Indeed, indeed, you will not tire me. Lean on me with all your weight. Lewis, with a sudden half-return of his normal strength and comfort. Ginny Gwynny, I think I shall recover after all. Sir Patrick looks significantly at Ridgeon, 
mutely warning him that this is the end. Yes, yes, you shall. Because I suddenly want to sleep. Just an ordinary sleep. Yes, dear, sleep. He seems to go to sleep. Walpole makes another movement. Shh, shh, please don't disturb him. His lips move. What did you say, dear? I can't listen without moving him. His lips move again. Walpole bends down and listens. He wants to know, is the newspaper man here? Yes, Mr. Dubedat. Here I am. Walpole raises his hand warningly to silence him. Sir Rafe sits down quietly on the sofa, and frankly buries his face in his handkerchief. Oh, that's right, dear. Don't spare me. Lean with all your weight on me. Now you are really resting. Sir Patrick quickly comes forward and feels Lewis's pulse, then takes him by the shoulders. Let me put him back on the pillow, ma'am. He will be better so. Oh, no, please. Please, doctor. He is not tiring me. And he will be so hurt when he wakes if he finds I have put him away. He will never wake again. He takes the body from her and replaces it in the chair. Ridgen, unmoved, lets down the back and makes a beer of it. Mrs. Dubedat, who has unexpectedly sprung to her feet, and stands dry-eyed and stately. Was that death? Yes. Will you wait for me a moment? I will come back. She goes out. Ought we to follow her? Is she in her right senses? Yes. She's all right. Leave her alone. She'll come back. Let us get this thing out of the way before she comes. My dear Collie, the poor lad, he died splendidly. Ay, that is how the wicked die, for there are no bands in their death. But their strength is firm, they are not in trouble as other men. No matter, it is not for us to judge, he's in another world now. Borrowing his first five-pound note there, probably. I said the other day that the most tragic thing in the world is a sick doctor. I was wrong. The most tragic thing in the world is a man of genius who is not also a man of honor. Ridgen and Walpole wheel the chair into the recess. I thought it showed a very nice feeling, his being so particular about his wife going into proper mourning for him and making her promise never to marry again. Mrs. Dubidoc is not in a position to carry the interview any further. Neither are we. Good afternoon to you. Mrs. Dubidat said she was coming back. After you have gone. Do you think she would give me a few words on how it feels to be a widow? Rather good title for an article, isn't it? Young man, if you wait until Mrs. Dubidat comes back, you will be able to write an article on how it feels to be turned out of the house. You'd think she'd rather not. Good day to you. Giving him a visiting card. Mind you get my name correctly. Good day. Good day. Thank you. Vaguely trying to read the card. Mr. No, not Mr. This is your hat, I think. Gloves? No, of course, no gloves. Good day to you. He edges him out at last, shuts the door on him, and returns to Sir Patrick as Ridgen and Walpole come back from the recess, Walpole crossing the room to the hat-stand, and Ridgen coming between Sir Rafe and Sir Patrick. Poor fellow, poor young fellow, how well he died. I feel a better man, really. When you're as old as I am, you'll know that it matters very little how a man dies. What matters is how he lives. Every fool that runs his nose against a bullet is a hero nowadays, because he dies for his country. Why don't he live for it to some purpose? No, please, Paddy, don't be hard on the poor lad. Not now, not now. After all, was he so bad? He had only two failings, money and women. Well, let us be honest. Tell the truth, Patty. Don't be hypocritical, Riggan. Throw off the mask, Walpole. Are these two matters so well arranged at present that a disregard of the usual arrangements indicates real depravity? I don't mind his disregarding the usual arrangements. Confound the usual arrangements! To a man of science they're beneath contempt both as to money and women. What I mind is his disregarding everything except his own pocket and his own fancy. He didn't disregard the usual arrangements when they paid him. Did he give us his pictures for nothing? Do you suppose he'd have hesitated to blackmail me if I'd compromised myself with his wife? Not he. Don't waste your time wrangling over him. A blackguard's a blackguard. 
An honest man's an honest man, and neither of them will ever be at a loss for a religion or a morality to prove their ways are the right ways. It's the same with nations, the same with professions, the same all the world over, and always will be. Ah, well, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. Still, de mortuis nil nisi bonum. He died extremely well, remarkably well. He has set us an example. Let us endeavor to follow it, rather than harp on the weaknesses that have perished with him. I think it is Shakespeare who says that the good that most men do lives after them. The evil lies interred with their bones. Yes, interred with their bones. Believe me, Patty, we are all mortal. It is the common lot, Riggan. Say what you will, Walpole. Nature's debt must be paid. If tis not to-day, twill be to-morrow. To-morrow and to-morrow and to-morrow. After life's fitful fever they sleep well. And like this insubstantial born from which no traveller returns, leave not a rack behind. Walpole is about to speak, but B.B., suddenly and vehemently proceeding, extinguishes him. Out! Out, brief candle, for nothing canst thou to damnation add, the readiness is all. Yes, B.B., death makes people go on like that. I don't know why it should, but it does. By the way, what are we going to do? Ought we to clear out? Or would we better wait and see whether Mrs. Dubedat will come back? I think we'd better go. We can tell the charwoman what to do. They take their hats and go to the door. Mrs. Dubedat coming from the inner door wonderfully and beautifully dressed, and radiant, carrying a great piece of purple silk, handsomely embroidered over her arm. I'm so sorry to have kept you waiting. Don't mention it, madam. By no means. Oh, it doesn't matter in the least. I felt that I must shake hands with his friends once before we part today. We have shared together a great privilege and a great happiness. I don't think we can ever think of ourselves ordinary people again. We have had a wonderful experience, and that gives us a common faith, a common ideal that nobody else can quite have. Life will always be beautiful to us. Death will always be beautiful to us. May we shake hands on that? Shaking hands. Remember, our letters had better be left to your solicitor. Let him open everything and settle everything. That's the law, you know. Oh, thank you. I didn't know. Sir Patrick goes. Good-bye. I blame myself. I should have insisted on operating. He goes. I will send the proper people. They will know what to do. You shall have no trouble. Good-bye, my dear lady. He goes. Good-bye. He offers his hand. Mrs. Dubedat, drawing back with gentle majesty. I said his friends, Sir Colenso. He bows and goes. She unfolds the great piece of silk, and goes into the recess to cover her dead. End of Act Four Act Five of The Doctor's Dilemma This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Doctor's Dilemma by George Bernard Shaw Act Five One of the smaller Bond Street picture galleries the entrance is from a picture-shop. Nearly in the middle of the gallery there is a writing-table, at which the secretary, fashionably dressed, sits with his back to the entrance, correcting catalogue-proofs. Some copies of a new book are on the desk, also the secretary's shining hat and a couple of magnifying-glasses. At the side, on his left, a little behind him, is a small door marked private. Near the same side is a cushioned bench parallel to the walls, which are covered with Dubedat's works. Two screens, also covered with drawings, stand near the corners right and left of the entrance. Jennifer, beautifully dressed and apparently very happy and prosperous, comes into the gallery through the private door. Have the catalogues come yet, Mr. Danby? Not yet. What a shame! It's a quarter past. The private view will begin in less than half an hour. I think I'd better run over to the printers to hurry them up. Oh, if you would be so good, Mr. Danby. I'll take your place while you're away. If anyone should come before the time, don't take any notice. The commissionaire won't let anyone through unless he knows him. We have a few people who like to come before the crowd, people who really buy, and of course we're glad to see them. 
Have you seen the notices in Brush and Crown and in the easel? Yes, most disgraceful. They write quite patronizingly, as if they were Mr. Jubadat's superiors. After all the cigars and sandwiches they had from us on the press day, and all they drank, I really think it is infamous that they should write like that. I hope you have not sent them tickets for today. Oh, they won't come again. There's no lunch today. The advanced copies of your book have come. He indicates the new books. Jennifer, pouncing on a copy, wildly excited. Give it to me. Oh, excuse me a moment. She runs away with it through the private door. The secretary takes a mirror from his drawer and smartens himself before going out. Ridgen comes in. Good morning. May I look round, as usual, before the doors open? Certainly, Sir Colenso. I'm sorry, catalogues have not come. I'm just going to see about them. Here's my own list, if you don't mind. Thanks. What's this? He takes up one of the new books. That's just come in. An advanced copy of Mrs. Dubidat's Life of Her Late Husband. The Story of a King of Men by His Wife. He looks at the portrait frontis. Aye, there he is. You knew him here, I suppose. Oh, we knew him. Better than she did, Sir Colenso. In some ways, perhaps. So did I. They look significantly at one another. I'll take a look round. The secretary puts on the shining hat and goes out. Ridgen begins looking at the pictures. Presently he comes back to the table for a magnifying glass, and scrutinizes a drawing very closely. He sighs, shakes his head, as if constrained to admit the extraordinary fascination and merit of the work, then marks the secretary's list. Proceeding with his survey, he disappears behind the screen. Jennifer comes back with her book. A look round satisfies her that she is alone. She seats herself at the table and admires the memoir, her first printed book, to her heart's content. Ridgen reappears, face to the wall, scrutinizing the drawings. After using his glass again, he steps back to get a more distant view of one of the larger pictures. She hastily closes the book at the sound, looks round, recognizes him, and stares, petrified. He takes a further step back which brings him nearer to her. Clever brute! She flushes as though he had struck her. He turns to put the glass down on the desk, and finds himself face to face with her intent gaze. I beg your pardon, I thought I was alone. I am glad we have met, Sir Colenso Ridgen. I met Dr. Blenkinsop yesterday. I congratulate you on a wonderful cure. Ridgen can find no words, makes an embarrassed gesture of assent after a moment's silence, and puts down the glass and the secretary's list on the table. He looked the picture of health and strength and prosperity. She looks for a moment at the walls, contrasting Blenkinsop's fortune with the artist's fate. He has been fortunate. Very fortunate. His life has been spared. I mean that he has been made a medical officer of health. He cured the chairman of the borough council very successfully. With your medicines? No. I believe it was with a pound of ripe greengages. Funny. Yes, life does not cease to be funny when people die, any more than it ceases to be serious when people laugh. Dr. Blenkinsop said one very strange thing to me. What was that? He said that private practice in medicine ought to be put down by law. When I asked him why, he said that private doctors were ignorant licensed murderers. That is what the public doctor always thinks of the private doctor. Well, Blenkinsop ought to know. He was a private doctor long enough himself. Come, you have talked at me long enough. Talk to me. You have something to reproach me with. There is reproach in your face, in your voice. You are full of it. Out with it. It is too late for reproaches now. When I turned and saw you just now, I wondered how you could come here coolly to look at his pictures. You answered the question. To you he was only a clever brute. Oh, don't. You know I did not know you were here. You think it only mattered because I heard it as if it could touch me or touch him. Don't you see that what is really dreadful is that to you living things have no souls? The soul is an organ I have not come across in the course of my anatomical work. You know you would not dare to say such a silly thing as that to anybody but a woman whose mind you despise. If you dissected me you could not find my conscience. Do you think I have got none? I have met people who had none. Clever brutes! Do you know, Doctor, that some of the dearest and most faithful friends I ever had were only brutes. You would have vivisected them. 
the dearest and greatest of all my friends, had a sort of beauty and affectionateness that only animals have. I hope you may never feel what I felt, when I had to put him into the hands of men who defend the torture of animals because they are only brutes. Well, did you find us so very cruel, after all? They tell me that though you have dropped me, you stay for weeks with the Bloomfield Bonningtons and the Walpoles. I think it must be true, because they never mention you to me now. The animals in Sir Ralph's house are like spoiled children. When Mr. Walpole had to take a splinter out of the Mastiff's paw, I had to hold the poor dog myself, and Mr. Walpole had to turn Sir Ralph out of the room. And Mrs. Walpole has to tell the gardener not to kill wasps while Mr. Walpole is looking. But there are doctors who are naturally cruel, and there are others who get used to cruelty and are callous about it. They blind themselves to the souls of animals, and that blinds them to the souls of men and women. You made a dreadful mistake about Lewis, but you would not have made it if you had not trained yourself to make the same mistake about dogs. You saw nothing in them but dumb brutes, and so you could see nothing in him but a clever brute. I made no mistake whatever about him. Oh, doctor! I made no mistake whatever about him. Have you forgotten that he died? Ridgeon, with a sweep of his hand towards the pictures. He is not dead. He is there. Taking up the book. And there. Put that down! How dare you touch it! Ridgeon, amazed at the fierceness of the outburst, puts it down with a deprecatory shrug. She takes it up and looks at it as if he had profaned a relic. I'm very sorry. I see I had better go. Jennifer, putting the book down. I beg your pardon. I forgot myself. But it is not yet. It is a private copy. But for me it would have been a very different book. But for you it would have been a longer one. You know, then, that I killed him. Oh, Doctor, if you acknowledge that, if you have confessed it to yourself, if you realize what you have done, then there is forgiveness. I trusted in your strength instinctively at first. Then I thought I had mistaken callousness for strength. Can you blame me? But if it was really strength, if it was only such a mistake as we all make sometimes, it will make me so happy to be friends with you again. I tell you, I made no mistake. I cured Blenkinsop. Was there any mistake there? He recovered. Oh, don't be foolishly proud, Doctor. Confess to a failure and save our friendship. Remember, Sir Ralph gave Lewis your medicine, and it made him worse. I can't be your friend on false pretenses. Something has got me by the throat. The truth must come out. I used that medicine myself on Blenkinsop. It did not make him worse. It is a dangerous medicine. It cured Blenkinsop. It killed Louis Dubedat. When I handle it, it cures. When another man handles it, it kills sometimes. Then why did you let Sir Ralph give it to Louis? I'm going to tell you. I did it because I was in love with you. In love? You? Elderly man! Do but that. Thou art avenged. I never thought of that. I suppose I appear to you a ridiculous old fogey. But surely. I did not mean to offend you, indeed. But you must be at least twenty years older than I am. Oh, quite. More, perhaps. In twenty years you will understand how little difference that makes. But even so, how could you think that I, his wife, could ever think of you? Yes, 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 yes. I quite understand. You needn't rub it in. But— Oh, it is only dawning on me now. I was so surprised at first. Do you dare to tell me that it was to gratify a miserable jealousy that you deliberately— Oh! Oh, you murdered him! I think I did. It really comes to that. Thou shalt not kill, but needst not strive officiously to keep alive. I suppose, yes, I killed him. And you tell me that? To my face? Callously, you are not afraid. I am a doctor. I have nothing to fear. It is not an indictable offence to call in B.B. Perhaps it ought to be, but it isn't. I did not mean that. I meant afraid of my taking the law into my own hands and killing you. I am so hopelessly idiotic about you that I should not mind it a bit. You would always remember me if you did that. I shall remember you always as a little man who tried to kill a great one. Pardon me, I succeeded. No. Doctors think they hold the keys of life and death. But it is not their will that is fulfilled. 
I don't believe you made any difference at all. Perhaps not, but I intended to. And you try to destroy that wonderful and beautiful life, merely because you grudged him a woman, whom you could never have expected to care for you. Who kissed my hands, who believed in me, who told me her friendship lasted until death. And whom you were betraying. No, whom I was saving. Pray, doctor, from what? From making a terrible discovery, from having your life laid waste. How? No matter, I have saved you. I have been the best friend you ever had. You are happy, you are well. His works are an imperishable joy and pride for you. And you think that is your doing? Oh, doctor, doctor, Sir Patrick is right. You do think you are a little god. How can you be so silly? You did not paint those pictures which are my imperishable joy and pride. You did not speak the words that will always be heavenly music in my ears. I listen to them now whenever I am tired or sad. That is why I am always happy. Yes, now that he is dead. Were you always happy when he was alive? Oh, you are cruel. Cruel! When he was alive I did not know the greatness of my blessing. I worried meanly about little things. I was unkind to him. I was unworthy of him. Ha! <sighs> Don't insult me. Don't blaspheme. She snatches up the book and presses it to her heart in a paroxysm of remorse. Oh, my king of men! King of men! Oh, this is too monstrous, too grotesque. We cruel doctors have kept the secret from you faithfully, but it is like all secrets, it will not keep itself. The buried truth germinates and breaks through to the light. What truth? What truth? Why, that Louis Dubedat, king of men, was the most entire and perfect scoundrel, the most miraculously mean rascal, the most callously selfish blackguard that ever made a wife miserable. He made his wife the happiest woman in the world, doctor. No, by all that's true on earth, he made his widow the happiest woman in the world. But it was I who made her a widow. And her happiness is my justification and my reward. Now you know what I did and what I thought of him. Be as angry with me as you like. At least you know me as I really am. If you ever come to care for an elderly man, you will know what you are caring for. I am not angry with you any more, Sir Colenso. I knew quite well that you did not like Lewis. But it is not your fault. You don't understand, that is all. You never could have believed in him. It is just like your not believing in my religion. It is a sort of sixth sense that you have not got. And don't think that you have shocked me so dreadfully. I know quite well what you mean by his selfishness. He sacrificed everything for his art. In a certain sense, he had even to sacrifice everybody. Everybody except himself. By keeping that back, he lost the right to sacrifice you, and gave me the right to sacrifice him, which I did. He was one of the men who know what women know. That self-sacrifice is vain and cowardly. Yes, when the sacrifice is rejected and thrown away, not when it becomes the food of Godhead. I don't understand that, and I can't argue with you. You are clever enough to puzzle me, but not to shake me. You are so utterly, so wildly wrong, so incapable of appreciating Lewis. Oh. Taking up the secretary's list. I have marked five pictures as sold to me. They will not be sold to you. Lewis's creditors insisted on selling them. But this is my birthday, and they were all bought in for me this morning by my husband. By whom? By my husband. What husband? Whose husband? Which husband? Whom? How? What? Do you mean to say that you have married again? Do you forget that Lewis disliked widows, and that people who have married happily once always marry again? The secretary returns with a pile of catalogues. Just got the first batch of catalogues in time. The doors are open. So glad you like the pictures, Sir Colenso. Good morning. Good morning. He goes towards the door, hesitates, turns to say something more, gives it up as a bad job, and goes. End of Act Five End of The Doctor's Dilemma by George Bernard Shaw